Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the 18th meeting in 2015 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Can I welcome all members, welcome our witnesses, who I'll introduce shortly, and welcome uh, visitors to the public gallery. And can I remind everyone, please, to turn off or at least turn to silent all mobile phones and other electronic devices so they don't interfere with the committee's work. Um, it's a small uh, housekeeping uh, issue. It's quite warm in here. If people want to remove their jackets, uh, feel free to do that. Um, nobody, nobody will be reprimanded for inappropriate dress. Uh, item one uh, on the agenda. Can I ask if members are uh, content that uh, responsibility is delegated to the convener for arranging the SPCB to pay under Rule 12.4.3 any expenses of witnesses to our inquiry. Agreed. So I agreed. agreed. Thank you. Agreed. Item two on the agenda, uh, can I ask if the committee are content that we take item four in private? Agreed. And can I also ask the committee uh, whether they are content that in future all reviews of evidence heard at future meetings in connection with the work wages and wellbeing inquiry are taken in private? Agreed. That's agreed. Thank you. Right, we now move to item three, and we're starting to take evidence on our inquiry into work, wages and well-being. I'd like to welcome our first panel, uh, Martin Talbot's with us, who is the Public Health Information Manager of NHS Health Scotland. We're also joined by Lucy Stokes, who's a Senior Research Fellow at the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, and Elaine Drennan, Head of Employability, Skills and Lifelong Learning Analysis at the Scottish Government. So welcome to you all. Now, the way we're going to run this this morning is we have two presentations, one from NHS Scotland and then one from uh, NIESR. Um, I think we're allowing roughly 15 minutes or so uh, for each, uh, starting with NHS Scotland. Um, I think um, what I'd quite like to do, if we can, is just allow um, the presenters just to run through the presentations without interruption. If there are kind of points of clarification you want to um, ask about, then, then by all means... You know, into catch my eye and we'll, 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 we'll interrupt. But I think we can try and keep the kind of substantive questions until we've seen both the presentations and then we can bring in the three uh, witnesses we have to answer any questions that, uh, that you might have. And we, I think we're allowing about, 45, that was about 50 minutes for each presentation and then about 45 minutes for discussion after that. So um, I'll hand over to you, Martin Talbot. Thank you for coming. Okay, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to come along this morning. Um, what I'm going to talk about in this first presentation is work and health, why it matters for Scotland, and what might be done. And what I'm going to cover in this presentation is, uh, the first point, just to get across, is that being out of work is bad for your health. It raises the risk of premature mortality and also raises the risk of other illnesses, particularly uh, mental health problems that good quality work is better for health than bad work, and I'll go on to define what precisely would be meant by that later on. Um, the importance of underpinning social security systems, which can act to protect or destroy health, and the substantial overlap between bad work and no work, um, where those people that are most exposed to the risk of being out of work are also those that are most likely to be looking for work which is bad for your health. And the final point, um, the, the bright spot in this really is to emphasise that none of this is inevitable and there's much that can be done about it. So, um, the, the slides uh, behind me, um, in the, the written evidence we submitted, um, we drew on uh, a study uh, from which gathered together evidence from more than 40 international studies that showed that premature mortality among the unemployed was more than 60% higher compared to those in work. This is some data specifically for Scotland, um, and what you see here is, is a kind of, uh, the, the risk of premature mortality for adults aged 35 to 64. It takes a sample of people in 1991, the 1991 census, and followed them up for seven years. And what you see on the, the, the y-axis is um, the risk of premature mortality. The comparison here is being in work, so being in work is one, so if the bar moves above one, then risk of premature mortality increases. And you can see that where you add in the, compare the unemployed to the employed, you can see here that the risk of premature mortality increases to uh, almost 60% higher 
which is in line again, as I've said, with the international studies, and that this risk extends to the early retired um, and also the permanently sick. Well, um, not all jobs are equal. Some jobs are, are better than others. But what makes a job good for health? Well, I think we can um, draw on the evidence to, to at least um, get some clearer ideas about what that might involve. Ideally, what you would want is um, employment that reduces uh, poverty and insecurity. Um, you would also want an appropriate balance between the level of control and demand at work. And what I mean by that is there's some strong evidence, particularly initially from the, the Whitehall studies, um, but subsequently over the last 30 years have accumulated quite a lot more evidence that um, if you have a fairly demanding job, um, a stressful job, that's not necessarily bad in itself. Um, but what seems particularly bad for your health is um, if you have low control over the way you the discretion you have about what, what you do um, at your job, how you go about it, um, and even extending to things like, for example, how easy would it be, for example, a family emergency, could you take time off readily, would that, would that be an issue? And where those things combine, where you have quite a demanding job and limited control, that's especially bad for health. Um, things that can help, well, manager and colleague support. If there's a degree of manager and colleague support there, then that can that can help protect some, somewhat against the ill effects of, uh, of employment. Um, and also, finally, effort and reward, where those are out of kilter. Um, again, from the Whitehall studies, but also from other, other research as well, um, where there's a perceived imbalance between the effort people put in at work and the re reward they receive, um, then that has a detrimental effect both on increasing the risk of um, premature mortality, but also a risk of other illnesses as well. To illustrate this, I'm, I'm using some data from the Scottish Health Survey. What you see here on the, the y-axis, the vertical axis, is a measure of mental health problems, the GHQ12. Higher proportions of um, having a, a high GHQ12 score would indicate a possible mental health problem. Um, Along the bottom of the slide, what I've done is I've split up the different categories of people in employment um, in the Scottish Health Survey, all of those people in employment, and divided them into <coughs> different groups by uh, two characteristics, um, how much control they report having over their work, um, and also um, whether they are in a, a low, mid, mid or high income household. Um, and you can see right at the end there, the, the high proportion um, of, of people um, with a possible mental health problem are those with the, the low income group, low household income, but also low control over their work. And then if you go right over to the left-hand side, you'll see that those with the lowest uh, proportion of people with possible mental health problems are those with uh, medium or high incomes, household incomes, but also a, degree, a high control over, over their work. Um, and you'll notice, too, that this isn't a simple distinction between uh, one group being, oh, that's, that's bad, and everyone else. But there's also a gradient there. So essentially, I think there could be, there's a reasonable argument to say you have to do both. You have to look at um, the degree of control people have at their, over their work, but also um, the amount of income going into people's households. I want to move on now and talk about the, the underpinning to this, um, social security and health. Um, and w what I'm going to show is that the, the type of uh, and the design of the so social security system does matter. Um, this is some data from Frank Popham and colleagues, published um, in 2013. And what they did was they compared the inequalities in life expectancy between the, those with the highest, groups with the highest life expectancy, groups with the lowest life expectancy, across a range of um, countries internationally. And they group these countries into different categories depending on how you would describe their welfare states. Um, so you've got the ex-Soviet um, welfare states there. Um, you've got the Nordics. Um, you've got the Bismarckian systems, which are the more kind of insurance-based systems that are used in Germany, uh, Belgium, and the Netherlands. And then you've got the Anglo-Saxon systems. The, the point here, uh, probably relevant to, to Scotland, is that um, it's around about the middle of the pack. Um, 
we may not be the, the worst at protecting against inequalities, but we're certainly not among, among the best. For men, it's the Nordic welfare states that seem to be best at protecting against reducing inequalities in mortality. And for women, um, it's a, a, the similar point can be made that the Anglo-Saxon states are not um, among the worst, but they're certainly not among the best. It's the Southern European and the Bismarckian systems, again, as I've said, that apply in uh, the Germ Germany, um, Netherlands, B Belgium, those kind of countries that are most, more effective at reducing health inequalities. In terms of um, looking at the role of work in uh, reducing inequalities, I think it's important to look at both the quantity of work available and the quality of work available. Um, this is some, some data that simply compares the number of vacancies reported through the, the Employer Skills Survey in 2013 and shows it in comparison to the number of uh, unemployed people um, using the, the survey-based measure in the annual population survey. In places like um, round about Aberdeen City and Shire, that, that region of Scotland, if you like, for every 10 unemployed people in 2013, there were round about um, 10 jobs vacancies available. Now, if everything was equal um, and everything's not equal, um, then you might suggest that it's, it might be relatively easier in that part of Scotland to secure employment. Everything's not equal, but anyway, let's move, move, on, to, move on to the next bit. Um, However, in other parts of Scotland, you've got the situation where, in 2013, Glasgow and the Clyde Valley, Tayside and the Forth Valley, um, for every 10 unemployed people, um, there were just two job vacancies in 2013. Um, so, again, all things being equal, it would be much harder for someone to, to seeking work to secure employment there. In terms of the quality of work, um, Again, the way I want to illustrate this is, again, to return to our measure of um, the GHQ12, which, again, as I said, is a measure of possible mental health problems on the, the y-axis, the vertical axis, higher scores indicating a, an increased uh, probable mental health problem. Um, along the horizontal axis, um, what I've shown is um, the, the best... What is that? Seven? Yes, okay, the best and, the best and uh, worst of uh, occupations in terms of how they rank um, in terms of possible mental health problems. These are just results for, for men. Um, they're pre preliminary and they're, but they are kind of illustrative of what's going on. And you can see that, for example, um, the highest risk of uh, me mental health problems among men in employment is observed for customer service occupations. So, for example... Um, that might include contact centre jobs, elementary trades, um, which is quite another big category there. So that would include, for example, um, warehousemen and labourers. Um, and also a smaller category for men, um, because it's more dominated by, by women, if you like, as uh, caring personal services. But they also have a higher, higher proportion of uh, people at a greater risk of mental health problems. Um, down at the other side of the, the graph, you can see um, occupations with rather lower risk of mental health problems. Um, it includes a number of professionals, but also, for example, skilled metal and electrical trades um, and protective services. Um, so, In terms of the, the kind of benefits of uh, promoting um, good work, and uh, fair employment. I think um, this can be illustrated through some work that was done by the Scottish Public Health Observatory, um, work that was published at the end of last year. And it was a, a, the Informing Investment to Reduce Health Inequalities tool, or III for short. And that looked at a range of different types of health interventions in terms of the contribution that they might make to improving population health and reducing health inequalities. Now, in the chart, um, if you move to, as you move along the right of that graph, you're seeing population health improving. So you start to accumulate um, lives being saved, potentially through particular interventions. As you move down the graph, um, below zero, you're seeing inequalities in health falling. So um, those that are most at advantage are, are gaining more, um, and health, the health gap is narrowing. Um, 
thankfully, you'll see that a lot of the interventions modelled um, have that effect. They all sit in the bottom right-hand quadrant and that they both, usefully, thankfully, they both increase, uh, sorry, wrong way. They both, yeah, okay. They both improve population health, so you're increasing the number of, of lives saved, um, and they also have an effect at reducing health inequalities. Um, but what you can also see there is that uh, some of the most uh, sorry, some of the most e effective uh, measures of reducing health inequalities are the living wage, um, um, which is quite effective in terms of its population health reach. Um, it's modestly effective at reducing health inequalities. It's not the most poverty reducing measure. Uh, precisely because of the way that um, employment and those paid below the living wage are, are structured in, in, in the economy and the type of households that they live in. Um, but it does have that uh, relatively positive effect. Um, the most effective at reducing health inequalities of the measures we looked at was an increase in the value of uh, job seekers' allowance and income support. And increased employment was also effective at both improving population health and reducing health inequalities when it was targeted at the most deprived areas of Scotland. So what might help? Um, we've suggested a, a number of uh, interventions um, in the, the written evidence. But I'm just going to try and summarise them briefly here, if that's OK. Uh, first of all, looking at job creation, proportionate to, to need. Um, secondly, perhaps a more balanced approach to social security and also looking at personal circumstances in more detail, looking at issues like childcare and the health conditions of people um, in work. And also when people move out of work, move from out of work to in work, um, is there anything that we can do to actually support them better to remain in employment and therefore sustain those health gains um, there? Also, um, increasing wages and benefits, um, I think that's important to, to underline um, that you have to look at increasing the income going into households as well as um, improving uh, the, the, the quality of work. And that, I think, is my second to last point, which is about looking to improve job quality. And the suggestion there is about improving uh, the voice of, of workers. Um, that could... Uh, include things like um, uh, improved uh, collective bargaining, um, but you could also look at um, legislation that would give a, a, a stronger voice and uh, perhaps greater enforcement um, that would uh, improve the quality of, of employment there. I just want to finish. I will be very quick, sorry. This is just a, a wee quote from Robert Burns. I'm not going to do an Ayrshire accent. Um, <laughs> I'll count my health my greatest wealth so long as I'll enjoy it. I'll fear no scan, I'll bode no one as long as I get employment. And I just thought there was a wee word missing there. So I would just thought I would add in as long as I get fair employment. Um, thank you very much for your time. I hope that's been useful and I hope it's on time as well. Okay. Uh, yes, right, exactly on time, Martin. So thank you very much. Okay, we're going to have a very brief suspension to allow a, a changeover. Right, if we can uh, reconvene, um, we now have Lucy Stokes, who is Senior Research Fellow at NIESR. Lucy, you have 15 minutes. 
Thank you. So, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to be here and for giving me the opportunity to talk about the Workplace Employment Relations Study. So, the remit for this presentation was to talk about the Workplace Employment Relations Study, or WERS, as it's known for short, and its findings in respect of job quality. WERS covers Great Britain, so I should say at the start that most of the findings I'm talking about today apply for Great Britain as a whole. Um, what am I going to talk about in this presentation? Um, first of all, I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to what WERS is to help place the findings in context. I'm going to talk about changes in various aspects of job quality in Britain between 2004 and 2011. So covering some of the aspects that Martin has just talked about, I look at changes in job security, work intensity and job autonomy, some changes in the types of support that employers might provide in terms of training provision and arrangements for facilitating work-life balance. Move on to look at relations between managers and employees and other important aspects of job quality and talk about some findings in respect of job satisfaction. I should note at the start that I'm not talking about information on wages today, which as we've seen already is, pay of, is of course one important aspect of job quality. But there are, although WERS does collect some information on pay, there are perhaps some other data sources out there that are more placed to give you a more detailed and um, up-to-date reflection of trends in earnings. Um, although I've said that mainly I'm going to focus on findings for Great Britain as a whole, we do have some selected findings specifically for Scotland and I will of course also be mentioning those. To give you a brief overview at the beginning of what the key findings are, we'll see that for Great Britain as a whole, some aspects of job quality have declined between 2004 and 2011. So we've seen falling job security and increasing work intensity. But other aspects have shown some improvement, for example, improvements in the control that employees have over their jobs and in some aspects of support. But what we do see is some clear differences in trends between the public and private sector, with typically employees in the public sector faring worse over this period. The findings that we do have available for Scotland overall show some similarities to the patterns observed for Great Britain as a whole. So what is WERS? Well, WERS is a national survey that maps the state of employment relations and working life inside British workplaces with five or more employees. It's unique and comprehensive in that it collects information from managers, employees and workplace representatives both union and non-union, within the same workplaces. It's a well-established study, so it began in 1980 with the first survey. There have been six surveys in all, the most recent taking place in 2011. And today when I talk about change, I'm going to look predominantly at change between 2004 and 2011, so the most recent two surveys in the series. It's a large study. Almost 2,700 workplaces were interviewed in 2011, we had also responses from around 1,000 employee representatives and almost 22,000 employees. It's an independent study, so the 2011 WERS had six sponsors, Department for Business Innovation and Skills, ACAS, the Economic and Social Research Council, UK Commission for Employment and Skills, the Health and Safety Executive and NISA, with NISA's involvement made possible through funding from the Nuffield Foundation. This mix of funders ensures that the study is independent and it's in all our interest that the study is impartial and rigorous. WERS has a good reputation for the quality of the data that it provides and it's endorsed by a range of employer, employee and industry organisations. So to move on to the findings in terms of changes in job quality for Great Britain as a whole, one of the most notable changes that we see in WERS over this period is a decline in job security. This decline has been driven particularly by what's happened in the public sector. So in 2004, in both the public and private sector, around two-thirds of employees agreed or strongly agreed with the statement, I feel my job is secure in this workplace. By 2011, in the public sector, this proportion had fallen to just below half, so falling from 66% to 47% of employees feeling their job was secure. In the private sector, we see a slight but much, much smaller fall. In terms of work intensity, we look at that in a few different ways. So overall, the percentage of employees that agreed that my job requires that I work very hard increased, rising from 76% in 2004 to 83% in 2011. Here we see an increase in work intensity on this measure in both the private and public sectors. We also ask employees whether they feel they have enough time to get their work done and the proportion of employees that felt this was the case remained fairly stable in the two surveys, standing around two-fifths of employees in each survey. We do see a small um, but statistically significant increase from 36% um, of employees feeling they never had enough time to get their work done 
in 2004 to 38% in 2011. However, overall, the proportion feeling this way remained higher in the public sector. We also asked a new question in the 2011 WERS about whether people felt long hours were necessary in order to progress at their workplace. Overall, around two-fifths um, two of employees agreed with that statement, higher in the private than in the public sector. We also see that that's more common in particular industries such as finance, education, hotels and restaurants. It's also more commonly reported by men than by women. As Martin mentioned in the presentation before, the autonomy or control that people have over, over their jobs forms an important part of theories about um, what contributes to employee well-being in the workplace. So where's asked employees um, how they feel about their level of control over five different aspects of their job? How the work is done, the order in which tasks are carried out, the pace with which they have to do the work, the tasks done in the job and start and finish times. And in the private sector between 2004 and 2011, we've seen some small but statistically significant improvements on all of those measures. In contrast, in the public sector, we see increases only in autonomy over the pace of work and autonomy over the tasks that are done in the job. So, so far, we've seen a bit of a mixed picture with falls in job security and rises in work intensity, but some improvements in job autonomy. So in the next part of the presentation, I'm going to move on to talk about what might be thought of as job supports, the first of which is training. So we might well have expected in a period that's effectively covered the recession and downturn that employers may well have cut back on training in this period. And indeed, in separate findings not reported on the study, we do find that around one-sixth of employers say they reduced expenditure on training in response to the recession. But if we look at the proportion of workplaces that were providing at least some of the job the training for at least 80% of their experienced employees in their biggest occupational group, we see that this has risen over the period 2004 to 2011. If we look within sector, overall the public sector is still more likely to provide training on this basis. However, there's been no improvement um, between the two surveys. It's the private sector where we've seen a rise from 31% to 40% of workplaces in the private sector doing so over this period. Employees themselves are also asked whether they feel that managers in their workplace encourage them to develop their skills. And here we see um, no, no change really, stability in the private sector. So um, around three-fifths of employees felt that they were encouraged to develop their skills in the private sector. However, in the public sector, we've seen a fall from 61% to 55% in 2011. So the, the provision of um, flexible working arrangements can play an important role in helping employees to balance their work with their lives outside. We see a mixed picture in terms of um, changes in the prevalence of flexible working arrangements from WERS. So employers were asked whether they provided a set of specified arrangements for any employees at their workplace. And here we see a bit of a mixed picture. So we see that there was an increase in workplaces that offered working from home for at least some of their employees rising from 26% to 30% over this period. We also see an increase in those that offered compressed hours, rising from 11% to 19%. At the same time, we see a reduction in those that offered the opportunity to reduce your working hours from 62% to 56% in 2011, and also a decline in the prevalence of job sharing. If we look within the public and private sectors, we see that fall overall in the percentage of workplaces that provided arrangements to reduce your working hours was driven largely by what had happened in the private sector. In terms of changes, otherwise, the sectors fared fairly similarly. Whether employees decide to take up flexible working arrangements may feel on whether they feel employers look favourably upon them doing so. The survey also asks employees whether they feel that managers understand about employees having to meet responsibilities outside of work. And we see an increase in the percentage of employees in the private sector that feel this way, rising from 59% to 63%, but a fall in the, in the public sector from 61% to 58%. At the same time, we see a rise in the percentage of managers who agreed with the statement, it's up to individual employees to balance their work and family responsibilities. That increase has occurred in both the public and private sectors, although it is larger within the public sector. Nevertheless, a fair amount of work-life conflict remains evident, with around one quarter of employees agreeing with the statement, I often find it difficult to fulfil my commitments outside of work because of the amount of time I spend on my job. So the relations between managers and employees forms another important aspect of job quality. 
And one way in which managers can provide support to their employees is by acting in a trustworthy manner and seeking to understand their views. So I ask employees a set of questions in an attempt to gauge changes here. So the percentage of employees within the private sector that felt that their managers were sincere in attempting to understand their views um, showed a small rise between 2004 and 2011 from 56% to 59%. We also see a similar small rise in the percentage that felt managers dealt with employees honestly. In contrast, in the public sector, we see no change on these measures. As the private sector was already faring better in these regards in 2004, these changes have served to further widen the gap between the two sectors between 2004 and 2011. Managers and employees, and indeed employee representatives, are also asked to rate relations between managers and employees at the workplace. There's always a gap here between perspectives from managers and employees, with managers being more likely, of course, to rate relationships with their employees as better. And so we do see some increase from 50% to 55% of managers rating relations as very good between 2004 and 2011. However, overall, we do see some small but significant um, increase among employees as well. So 62% of employees in 2004 rated relations at their workplace as good or very good, rising to 64% in 2011. In terms of job satisfaction, so WERS asks employees about their satisfaction with their job on a number of aspects. And our analysis here uses the eight aspects of job satisfaction that were consistent between the 2004 and 2011 surveys. So specifically, those are satisfaction with pay, satisfaction with the sense of achievement you get from your work, your scope for using your initiative, influence, training, job security, the work itself, and your involvement in decision-making. So we combine all of those different aspects into an overall job satisfaction scale. Employees are asked to rate their satisfaction effectively on a five-point scale. We also separate out satisfaction with pay from satisfaction with the non-pecuniary aspects of the job, so all the other aspects that I've just mentioned. So in the private sector, we see an increase in um, employee satisfaction with pay over the period from 2004 to 2011. We also see an increase in their satisfaction on all other aspects of their job, with the exception of satisfaction with job security. In the public sector, however, while we also see an increase in satisfaction with pay, we do not see any improvement on most aspects of, of job satisfaction, except for scope for using initiative, and we see a big decline in satisfaction with job security, reflecting the fall in perceptions of job security that we've seen earlier. Okay. So all the findings that I've talked about so far have been for, for Great Britain as a whole. But last year, one of my colleagues, John Forth at NISA, was commissioned by ACAS to undertake a study of selected employment relations measures um, by the ACAS region. So that includes some findings for Scotland that cover some of the measures I've talked about today. In terms of what that finds, it shows many similarities to the picture for Great Britain as a whole. So if I move on to the next slide, we see... Um, Figures for Scotland show, um, again, a fall in the percentage of employees feeling their job was secure in their workplace, from 68% in 2004 to 62% in 2011. We see a rise in the percentage of employees agreeing their job requires them to work very hard, from 74% to 81%, similar again to the position we saw for um, the rest of Great Britain. We've also seen a rise in the percentage of employees reporting that they have a lot of influence over three specific aspects of their jobs. Oh, and also, indeed, um, there's also been an improvement in um, employees feeling their managers were understanding of employees' responsibilities outside of work. Overall, in 2011, levels of job satisfaction in Scotland look similar to those observed in the rest of Great Britain. So to give you a summary um, of the main points, we've seen decline in some aspects of job quality between 2000 and 2011 in Britain, with a fall in job security and a rise in work intensity. But other aspects have improved, with improvements in job autonomy and other aspects of support. However, there are some clear differences between the public and private sectors, with the private sector faring better in terms of improvements in job autonomy and supportive management, and showing less of a decline in job security. However, both sectors have seen an increase in work intensity. And as we've seen from the findings just presented, many of these um, factors seem to apply for Scotland as well as for Great Britain as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. That was uh, fascinating. Um, again, we'll have a very uh, short suspension to allow a changeover.
uh, reconvene. I'd like to introduce Elaine Drennan this time. And Elaine doesn't have a PowerPoint presentation for us, but it's going to talk to uh, our paper. Right, uh, thank Elaine. You. Thank you. Um, thank you for introducing me here today. Um, I head up the uh, Employability Skills and Lifelong Learning Analytical Team within the Scottish Government. Um, what I'm going to talk to today about is the change in the labour market since 2008. Um, what do we think is um, <clears throat> the term job quality? What does that mean? And talk a bit about what data is available. Um, despite the challenging circumstances since 2007, Scotland's economic uh, performance has improved uh, relative to the UK. Long-standing gaps between Scotland and the UK in terms of productivity, labour market participations and earnings have reduced. Um, but following the end of the recession, um, <clears throat> although Scotland's labour market has uh, strengthened uh, significantly, there's been a rise in um, employment, um, risen to a level of 2.6 million of people in work, and a consistent fall in the headline rates that are now approaching pre-recession levels. However, um, the legacy of the recession remains evident, particularly on youth unemployment. Um, it remains high at more than double the overall um, unemployment rate, and it's still not um, at the level it was um, pre-recession. Um, the recession has also led to uh, an increase in levels of un underemployment and part-time working. The number of people un underemployed, although it's falling, it currently stands uh, at 38 per cent higher than in 2008. Um, Part-time employment <clears throat> is also up 11 per cent since 2008, while full-time employment has only just started to come back to get close to pre-recession levels. Um, real wages um, also remain substantially below pre-recession levels, uh, and employment among disabled people, ethnic minority groups, and older workers also remain well below the national average. Job insecurity has been a feature of the recession uh, and with a number of uh, people uh, employed on zero hours contracts um, and also pose real questions for the individual about the reliability of their income, security of employment and the balance of power between uh, employer and worker. So what do we, how do we define job quality? Um, I think there are a number of uh, areas to consider uh, the impact Quality, job quality has on the individual level, such as health and well-being, um, on the firm level, which has a, an impact on absenteeism, motivation and employee engagement, and also about the impact on the overall economy, where the aggregate impacts can affect overall input, uh, output, productivity and economic growth. So although there's no single definition, I think we can think of it in terms of task factors, employment factors and workplace factors. The task factors um, in particular uh, focus on the level of opportunity uh, an employee has to influence the work that they do, how they organise their work, uh, their working conditions and level of job intensity, um, access to opportunities for training and development. Employment factors include um, pay, job insecurity, hours of work, flexible working arrangements, clarity around the um, terms and conditions of their employment. Among these factors is also low pay, <coughs> uh, and the low pay can be associated with some negative outcomes for individuals, including poor health, uh, diminished life chances, and higher risk of being uh, in poverty. Um, the Resolution uh, Foundation also has research saying um, low pay um, means you're also at higher risk of um, becoming unemployed and also less likely to progress in the workplace. Um, workplace factors um, broadly fall into um, the relationships and governance at work, including uh, the perception of fairness, trust and respect, confidence in the ability <coughs> and integrity of colleagues and managers, and access to employee representation, uh, and also uh, in matters relating to kind of um, grievance, discipline and dismissal policies. So what... Uh, what data uh, is available at a Scottish level? Um, Lucy just covered in quite um, um, detail about the, the WHERE survey, the uh, Workplace Employee Relations Survey, um, which presents a lot of information on um, 
job quality. But again, it is um, the last uh, data was uh, 2001. So what else can we look at that's more recent? The annual population survey um, provides information on training and development, hours of work. Um, and we've also got the UK Employer Skills Survey, um, which provides some more information on training and development. The other source is the annual survey of hours and earnings, which gives us the main source of information on pay. In terms of um, disaggregation by sector and geography, um, most of the main surveys provide some level of disaggregation, with the exception of the Workplace and employer, uh, Employment Relations Survey. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Elaine, uh, for that, that summary of, of your paper. Now, um, we've got about 35 minutes or so for questions and discussion, um, which is not a lot, a lot of time to discuss all the very broad range of topics that are available to us. I would just, I would just say, say both to witnesses and, and, and remind members, I think the purpose of today's sessions really is, is scene setting. So we're not here to kind of conduct the whole inquiry. We're not here to, to get to the bottom of every single issue. It's more just to, to understand the headline issues and the members would, would bear that in mind when they're, they're asking their questions. That, that would be helpful. I just wanted to pick up a couple of things I thought were very interesting. Uh, first of all, going on... Um, uh, the message that, that came, came to me through, through Martin Talbot's presentation was the importance of control in terms of job quality, how control is such an important factor. And then the presentation from Lucy Stokes, which developed some of that and said, actually, there have been some developments in the period you identified, 2014 to 2011, where many employ employees are reporting better control, but that was more prevalent in the private sector than the public sector. I thought that was quite an interesting development. The other issue I just wanted to pick up, and it was in, in your written submission, um, Martin Talbot um, from um, uh, NHS Scotland, um, talking about low quality work. There is a comment you make that the prevalence of low quality work in the United Kingdom is not high compared to other Europe European countries, although lower rates are observed for the Netherlands and Denmark. I thought that was an interesting comment because it, it seems... Um, Countercultural in terms of some of the chatter we hear around the nature of the employment market in the UK, where um, there's a lot of uh, suggestion that you know we're a, we're a low pay, uh, low productivity economy. But you seem to be saying here that um, we're not as bad as some of our European competitors. Well, um, I do. I did actually do a wee bit, a wee bit of, of, of work in it, and um, again, this is based on other people's analysis. Okay, so what, what I've kind of looked at was um, uh, the European countries, and these figures are from, from 2010, and I looked at kind of four different ways of looking at the, the labour market, one of which is the proportion of bad jobs. Now, you could describe that in various ways, and you can define it in various ways. The data comes from the European work, um, Working Conditions Survey. Um, and... Right at the, the, the bottom, in terms of the best, the lowest proportion of, of, of bad jobs, if you like, um, are Netherlands, um, Denmark, uh, Sweden and Luxembourg are there as well. The UK is round about um, a third of jobs. Um, and some very, very preliminary analysis, um, I have to go back and <laughs> look at this in more detail, suggests that Scotland is not that different in terms of bad jobs. However, um, it's also within the context of if you look at other things like um, in-work poverty, um, the UK sits among the middle of the pack, um, out-of-work poverty, um, it's towards the, the bottom of the pack, if you like. Um, employment rates, it's, it's not bad I, either, um, so it's relatively high employment rates, although um, Netherlands and Denmark and other countries um, also do better as well. Um, so in the very different countries from the UK and Scotland and very different countries from each other, but I, I think it's just to illustrate the point that, I mean, none of this is inevitable. You can achieve the kind of uh, quadruple. I, I shouldn't do any sporting analogies at all. What do I know about sport? Um, but you can achieve uh, low levels of poverty in and out work and you can achieve uh, a low proportion of bad jobs and you can achieve uh, a high employment rate. So it is possible to, to achieve that, I suppose, was my, my point. 
Is that all right? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, and, uh, these may well be issues that the committee decides to come back to when we get into the, the, the full inquiry, but that's very interesting just to set the scene. Okay, I've got a list of members who want to come in. Um, I'll start off with uh, Lewis MacDonald. Following up, I, I think, precisely on, on that point, first of all, um, with Martin Talbot, very interesting to explore that a little, a little further because clearly some of what you described were types of work and types of uh, uh, sectors of the economy which will be uh, which will exist in every country. Customer relations, um, uh, low-skilled jobs do exist in every economy, but, but, but it's how you make those jobs good for people or bad for people that, that seems to be the, the key issue. Now, I think in your presentation you said that depending on the definition used, you could deduce that anything from 10% to 30% 10 to of jobs in the Scottish economy are, are bad for your health. Uh, and, 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 and you, 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 uh, you fleshed that out a bit in, in your presentation. I wonder if you'd like to say a little bit more about that issue of how you define those jobs that are bad for your health, and, and, and because the difference between 10% and 30% is clearly a very significant one. Uh, and I wonder if you'd like to say a little bit more about that and what, what influences that range of, of, of definitions. Well, yes. I mean, this is, this is again, taken from uh, work from the European Working Condition Survey. Um, and, and it's, again, really just um, how you package together, um, what kind of questions you use, what kind of questions you, you want to include in that. So it can be quite... I appreciate that's quite a big, a big range. Um, the, the, the pattern is... Um, the pattern of the types of jobs are similar. Um, how you get from um, that 10% to the 30% is you have jobs which are um, bad on almost everything. Um, if you want to put it as crudely as that, although what I would say is that the European surveys are, are quite good on this in saying that even within jobs of the same type and industries of the same type, there's quite a lot of room for uh, manoeuvre there. Um, you have jobs that are bad in almost everything, and you have jobs which are poorly balanced um, in that they are perhaps poorer on some aspects but not on others. So that, that explains that kind of range. So how tightly you want to draw that boundary, whether you want to go for, well, do we, do we look at the jobs which are worst um, or potentially the worst? Because, as I've said, um, individual jobs and individual employers, there's a lot of spectrum. There's a spectrum there. Um, or do you want to do some sort of combination there? Um, and also, you might want to move into spheres where you say, well, there are jobs which are sort of, and industries and occupations which are sort of middling, if you like, um, where there may even be more scope to improve things. Do you want to look at those kinds of jobs and occupations as well? Um, I, ho I hope that's a wee bit clearer. It is. I think one of the things we're keen to understand is, is how is, is first of all what jobs are bad for people, and second how, how to make them better. Uh, and I think I think you've indicated that, that, that there is a range already. I wonder if I could ask Lucy Stokes a little bit about on the same in the same territory. Some of what you said uh, in presenting your research implied that public sector workers have particularly seen their job quality going down, part, largely but not entirely because of issues of job security in the last um, number of years. I wonder if you'd like to expand on that, and particularly the issue of the impact of, of reduced job security on public sector workers. How many people, are, or how far are people in jobs in the public sector finding themselves having started a job at a point at which it was relatively secure and gave them a relatively decent degree of control, now find themselves in a job that's not good for them. Sure. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, we see it. We see some clear patterns in that um, the public sector employees seem to have fared worse in terms of job quality over this period, and um, particularly in terms of job security. Um, although, though, though not solely, where other aspects of the private sector seems to have moved ahead when the public sector hasn't. Um, we looked particularly, of course, at um, the relationship between all of these aspects and recessions. So rather than in, um, in the findings that I've talked about, I've sort of compared 2004 and 2011 without... Of course, we all know that's a period where the economy has seen a big change, and I haven't explicitly said, is this about recession or not? So where's included some other questions that were about um, looking at the extent to which the workplace was affected by the recession. 
and you see job security is, um, well, is particularly cyclical. So you can see that the job security really took most of a hit in those workplaces where managers said that workplace was particularly harshly affected by recession. Um, you do see, if you look at, um, what's quite interesting is if you look at um, perceptions of job security and redundancies that had taken place in the workplace, um, it's not as closely related with redundancies as you, might, as you might expect. So in some cases, employees might have been looking at what was to come, perhaps fearing austerity in the public sector, perhaps fearing more what was to come rather than what they had seen already happen as such. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. It, it, it does, certainly, in, in part. I mean, I, I, I think one of the things, and you mentioned that it's not your study or the comparison of the two dates don't quite match the period of recession, but they clearly cover it. Yeah. Um, and, and some of what you described around, for example, reduced job sharing, um, but increased flexibility in other ways, yeah. may well be impacts of employer decisions during yes. the recession. Absolutely. I wonder how many of those you think are changes that have become permanent or, 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 or um, are, are, are emergency responses to emergency circumstances that will correct themselves yeah. again? So um, there's, um, there was, there's, I had to be selective in what I presented in today's presentation. There are a number of findings in words that you may find relevant that I couldn't cover today. But um, if you, you look specifically at, at changes that employees did experience in response to recession, we asked them that. So the employees that were at, at the workplace at the point that they deem there to be recession. And um, the, biggest, the biggest reported changes were that um, they experienced that their wages were frozen or cut, that they experienced an increase in their workload. They were the most common, and again, continuing the theme, these were more commonly reported in the public sector than they were in the private sector. Um, again, um, considerable proportions reporting that work was reorganised. Um, in terms of flexibility, um, sizable proportions saying access to paid overtime was restricted and some about changes to organisation of work, but that, of course, is a broad term and might cover some changes in terms of flexible working arrangements but may almost also be seen in a broader sense of um, reorganising how work is done within the working place. A relatively um, smaller proportion, I think 5% of all employees, had their contracted working hours reduced um, in response to recession. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Convener, and uh, good morning, and uh, can I thank you all for your presentations. Um, perhaps it, it, it's really to, to all the witnesses uh, in respect, maybe start with Martin, but it's the methodologies around the collection of data and the various surveys and the, the analysis of them all. Um, the, there's quite a myriad of, of information out there. And I'm just wondering, at the end of the day, um, how closely, uh, do, do you think that the, the information that is being collated is all as much and much the same? Uh, or is there um, significant differences? Um, because what we need to try and do is to establish as to whether or not um, the, the variations, if they exist, are significant enough to actually question the data being collected? Mr Talbot, first. Okay. Um, well, there's a lot of um, surveys, um, I'm sure, um, have gone in here, here about them as, as well. And they do collect information on aspects that are important to health. We have now some questions in the Scottish Health Survey that have been in for a number of years looking at um, aspects of psychosocial health at work, so um, control, demand, uh, workplace stress and so on. There's also um, in labour market type surveys, the annual population survey, the labour force survey, um, asks some questions that are more perhaps related to um, physical um, risks to health, health at work. Um, Going, sorry. I think what I'm trying to get at is the, the methodology used in, in all the different surveys. You know, if we, if we then sort of take them and sort of look at the comparisons, um, how, how definite can we be when, when we're looking at this in terms of uh, moving forward to help us understand the impacts of some of the inequalities that, that are around in terms of the, um, say, mental health within the workforce? 
the, the questions that are available in, in most of the surveys on control, which is, is a very important aspect for mental health, they're, they're, they differ slightly, but I think they tell us a consistent picture. Um, the questions on demand um, at work, um, they, they differ a, a wee bit more. Um, so I, I think more work might be needed in that area to maybe look at, just purely from a health perspective, that's all, um, to look at um, what, precisely, what, what precisely we're look, looking at there. Um, and there may also be scope to look at whether, for example, um, could you include measures of mental health in some of the big labour market surveys? Um, but that, that, I suppose, is just a suggestion. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Lucy. Yeah. Lucy Stokes, do you want to say something? Yeah, I think you raise a, re a really important point, actually, and I would definitely stress that, that where any information comes from, it's really important to, to look at the methods that have been used in collecting that. One of um, the advantages of WERS, um, I would say, is that because it collects information from different perspectives, from managers and employees, I quite like that dual aspect on things. Um, but definitely, I mean, I think different, different surveys, of course, have all come about with different um, intentions and histories, which lead them to ask things in slightly different ways and so on. Um, and they can sometimes point to slightly different pictures. So um, the findings that I've talked about in respect of employees in WERS um, reporting improvements in job control over that period. If you look at the responses from managers, which are asked a slightly different question about autonomy in their largest occupational group, you see there that the picture looks a bit more stable. You will see if you look at the skills and employment survey, again, there you see a bit more stability. And so I think but there are slightly different questions and, of course, there are different ways in which the information is collected. And so for those very reasons, I, I think it's very important that any information you do have looks at the questions that have they've been asked and the way in which um, the way in which those data have been collected. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer of saying which are valid and which are not. I, I think it's it's really a case of under, of really understanding when when someone says, okay, so this is improved job control. Well job control in terms of what what was the question they actually asked. Thank you. Elaine? Yeah, I think it's important to remember that you know, the surveys are asking different things. Uh, some of them, like the WERS, really go into the depth of the topic, whereas the, the, the Labour Force Survey and the Annual Population Survey is more about the timeliness of data, although it captures activity. Um, we, we, we want the data to have a lot more timely. Um, there's also the methods in which people, uh, the information is gathered. A lot of it is self-reported as well, so it's people's perception of what they think their position is. Um, but we also have surveys like the, the, the annual um, survey of hours and earnings. It's a, an employer survey, so that's getting information from their, their administrative records as well, which is considered a bit more accurate than some of the self-reporting aspects of it. So I think it's important that we take all these things into account to understand the strengths and the limitations of some of the data that we're using. Um, but also um, when it's uh, the, 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 the story it's telling is maybe not as consistent as we would want it to be. Okay. Maybe stay with yourself just Elaine. I, I know we're short on time, uh, convener. Stay with yourself at the moment, Elaine. Um, are we able to manage the impact of some external factors, for instance, the work that, say, Sam H has been doing in the workplace um, to enable people to understand better, um, say, mental health issues and the reporting of, and managers are, are maybe more equipped to understand the impact for the employees, and employees are more able to understand, um, see uh, some of the issues around mental health and reporting. Uh, are we able to take those factors into consideration? What well, in terms of the information that we provide? Yeah. Um, yeah, to, to a certain extent. Again, it's bringing the, the, the information together. We tend to provide the results of the surveys in sort of isolation um, from each other. But again, Martin's talked about the results of the Scottish Health Survey, and perhaps we don't make better use of um, the information that's in other surveys, um, where the, the information on mental health is much better um, and, and than it is in, say, the, the annual population survey. So that is certainly something that we could possibly mental explore. Mental health, because it seems to be one that obviously has a significant impact and, and, and obviously how how we do work, <laughs> in many ways. Lucy, are you, are you aware of any external 
factors that do we take into account the impact of say the people becoming more aware Sorry, of people becoming more aware. More aware of, of say, their mental health and how they can report it and how managers yeah. um, uh, maybe sure. acknowledge. Okay, yeah. And Wales doesn't ask specifically about mental health, although it asks um, about some measures of, of well, broader well-being in terms of anxiety and, and, and depression, indeed. So aspects of mental health, although different to the measures that are collected in some other surveys. Um, one of the things that that strikes me, I guess, thinking about reporting of, of mental health is, of course, how well it is reported. Um, so, as you say, whether managers are fully aware of mental health issues um, in their workplaces to be able to report it in a survey, um, how individuals feel, I guess, in different survey contexts about reporting their own health issues. Indeed, whether um, someone in poor mental health is simply less likely to respond to a survey in the first place, meaning that they're not there in the data. So, yeah, I think they are... There are important okay. issues and Thank difficulties you. there. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll bring in Gordon MacDonald. I think he's yeah. got a similar question. Yeah. Um, we'll There's the, the subject of we should always look at the methods behind uh, any survey. So I was wanting to ask you a couple of questions about your survey. Um, the first one is the percentages. Um, are they just straight percentages of, of the responses or are they weighted in any way to, say, reflect... Um, the range of size of organisations from small SMEs to uh, large multinationals to reflect yeah. the, the range of organisations within uh, the economy. I mean, is there any weighting yeah. in there? Yeah, there is. Um, so the findings that I presented are a mix of um, findings from the employee survey and from the manager survey, but everything is weighted. So, um, so they, are, they can be considered representative of the economy as a whole in, in the findings that we report of WERS covers workplaces with five or more employees. So every time I give a workplace finding, it's representative of that population. You're, you're right, absolutely. There is, um, for technical reasons, when you sample the survey, you oversample certain groups of workplaces to make sure you have enough, but we have a set of weights that allow us to correct for that in the analysis. Right. The same, absolutely. Is, is there a margin of error in the numbers then? Because a lot of the numbers are very close to each other. Yeah. So, you know, for instance, um, the one for public sector, which says... Employees agreeing, I have never seemed to have enough time to get my work done, yep. suggests that that's went down from 51 to 48, which wouldn't suggest that, uh, you know, given the budget constraints in the public sector, that that would be the case. But, you know, of course, if there's a 3% margin of error, it could actually be increasing. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Any, any survey estimate, there is always a margin of error around it because it's, it's, not, it's an estimate of what the true value is out there. Um, what I, should, I don't know how clearly you can see it on the slides, but um, where there is a, an underline under a number, it means that that change was statistically significant between 2004 and 2011. So if there is no underline, that change is, is not statistically significant. As you say, sometimes you'll see a small difference in the numbers, um, but because of, there is a margin of error, we can't be confident that that is a true change in the population as a whole. Right, so the significant ones are the ones that are underlined they effectively. Are absolutely they and um, of the 2,700 workplaces that were surveyed, mm -hmm. what proportion of them were in Scotland? What number of them were in Scotland? It is 276 in right, Scotland. Right, so ten, roughly 10%. Yes. <laughs> uh, that means I can ask my last question then. My last question is um, the page on trust in management and the widening yeah. gap. Um, while I accept that you know, they're not underlined and therefore they're not significant, um, yeah. they all show a declining picture. So why in the public sector do you think it's, it's a declining picture where it isn't in the private? Why, why overall is there yeah. a, a declining picture yeah. in, the, in trust than there is in... Well, <laughs> in the public a, sector as opposed to the private sector. As opposed to the private sector. Mm. Well, it's a, of course, and, of course, indeed, the private sector seems to be in a better, position, a better starting position in 2004. I mean, I can't, I can't answer that question in a, in a factual way with findings from WERS that show you why, yeah. why, why um, this has changed, although I'm sure um, it would be possible to, to look into that in some analysis. Um, broader factors, I guess, it's... Actually, we looked for a relationship here with what had happened in recession because we anticipated that in workplaces where there had been cutbacks and so on, that perhaps there was an atmosphere of declining, declining trust going on there. But actually, it's not as straightforward as that. That seems to have been a bit more of a, if you look across the public sector, that seems to have been a bit more of a, a general phenomenon, this decline. Mm. So whether that's 
not specifically about what happened in those workplaces, but a perception of austerity and so on impact in general. It's difficult to say, so I can't give you a, a factual answer from words of, you know, it's this factor that mm. contributed, but it's a broader picture. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, can I remind members, we are quite short of time. We've got about another uh, 15 minutes or so left. I've got four members want to come in, and I'll start with Patrick Harvey. Um, thanks very much, convener. Good morning. Um, I suppose, again, thinking about the, this question about how we frame the rest of the inquiry and, and sort of where we go from a starting point, several of the, uh, the, the discussions and some of the presentations as well uh, have been uh, almost leading us to think about this as a comparison either with other countries, are we a little bit better or a little bit worse than the European average, uh, or with how things have moved over time. Um, if we're looking to discuss the impact of work and wages on well-being, uh, isn't it reasonable that we should focus on what we know about that impact rather than whether it's a little bit worse or, or a little bit better than our neighbours? If, if there's an injustice uh, that's happening, uh, does it actually matter that it might be happening in other European countries as well just as badly? Um, and I, I guess also... I'd like to ask, what can we say about the long-term impact uh, of uh, work and, and wages or what's happening to them uh, on health and well-being as opposed to the immediate impact? I'm thinking in particular about a, a, a generational impact, for example. We, we know, and there's a great deal of, of re recognition these days, that um, the impact of uh, young people's children's early years uh, is crucial in uh, in, in shaping their, their likely health outcomes for the rest of their lives. If a parent doesn't have the confidence to know what their income is going to be one month to the next, one week to the next, uh, if they're not in control of their working hours because their employer controls uh, has all of the, the control of the flexibility, uh, can we say anything about the likely long-term impact uh, on the health of the population uh, given those, those kind of factors? Can I, yep. can I offer a Whoever few, wants a, a few have comments? Whoever wants to have a first stab at that. Is that, is that okay? Um, well, we, we do have evidence from the, the Growing Up in Scotland study um, and also from the, the bigger UK studies as well, the, the Millennium, Millennium Cohort study, um, and also a whole range of kind of longitudinal studies which uh, highlight really the, the importance of what happens in early years. Some, some of the most important things... Um, that correlate with how well someone does later in life, um, the social and emotional well-being. Um, and if you look at what, what's the most important factors in, child, in childhood for influencing that, um, the most important factors that seem to come out include um, worklessness, um, low-income households, and uh, uh, the mental health of parents especially the, the mental health of, of, of mothers. Um, now, if you join a couple of those, those things up, um, you have, for example, um, if you look at um, the, how the mental health of, of, of different groups of the population compare, if you look at um, low- and mid-income uh, individuals living in a low, lower mid-income household um, who are looking after home and family, I would suggest they're more likely to be female. Um, not always, but probable. And then you compare their mental health to those who are who have got low income and low control, um, and they're, they're roughly about a quarter in all cases. So the inference, I think, from that is if you're moving, for example, from... Um, a relatively low income with caring responsibilities, for example, and then you're moving into a job with low control, um, but your income hasn't changed very much, that's not going to be very good for either your income um, and it's not going to be very good for your mental health. And to come back to what I said earlier, um, it's difficult to see how that in itself, as the situation currently stands, is going to be very good at improving the emotional well-being of children, of, of, of children um, and we've already seen, again, as I've said, from lots of studies that show if you track children, children through life, 
um, those children with poorer social, emotional well-being and childhood. Um, they experience a range of poorer outcomes in, in adulthood. So I think this is partly why this is, this is important. Um, is that helpful at all? I, th I think I'm, I'm trying to explore something which uh, maybe doesn't have a definitive answer yet, but the, 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 the comments are helpful. Uh, does anybody else want to comment on this? Yeah. I think um, the work um, from the Resolution Foundation, um, when they looked at the panel data from the new earnings survey, they showed that 29% um, of people that were currently low paid had been in uh, low paid jobs for the past decade. Uh, and they were least likely to progress up. And that's a, a really important um, statistic because I think it means that those people that are um, low paid, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a long-term uh, position and that will therefore have impact on people's health. As Martin has said, we have evidence uh, to show that the impact on people's health is, is, can be quite negative on that. So um, we, we could do further work to see what we could pull out on that sort of longer term impact through the longitudinal studies. Uh, and I assume the Scottish Government is already doing some work uh, in relation to how some degree of, of welfare, uh, devolved welfare policy will connect with this agenda and, and what the options are. Is there anything you can say to us at the moment about where that work has got to? It's still very early days. Uh, and in that sort of work, we're, we're looking at doing some analysis um, to support the, the, the Fair Work Convention. And again, we'll be able to kind of um, share that with the committee once mm -hmm. that's finished. I'd also just like to ask, if I can, about how, to, how we can avoid, uh, when we're looking at the, the various statistics, for example, much of what was in Lucy Stokes' presentation, uh, about what the overall picture is. How can we avoid falling into the trap of, of looking at what the average picture is and thinking that's meaningful? Uh, there's, there's been some research recently that shows that uh, between 97 and 2013, for example, uh, the, uh, the richest 1 or 2% of Scottish society saw their real incomes increase by more than a quarter, but the poorest 3 or 4% uh, saw a real uh, drop in their incomes of about a tenth. And that's despite overall growth in the economy over that whole period. So if we're, if we're looking at that inequality of incomes, is there also a chance that we're looking at the same kind of inequalities of people's control in the, of their work, of people's trust in their managers? Uh, so even if there's an overall increase or decrease, uh, I think how do we explore whether the perception of a, a gulf, a growing gulf, uh, is, is an accurate one? Yep, absolutely. That was um, the point that had sprung up in my mind when you talked about we look very much at comparative elements over time or with other countries, and it's exactly what was sort of in my mind when you, you know, been talking very much about what's been happened on average, and of course that forgets perhaps that there are groups that perhaps are having very bad experiences, and they are perhaps the ones we should be, yes, and, and that we we need to focus on. So absolutely, I think um, it's very difficult in giving a broad overview not to focus on the average but absolutely I think that there's a, definitely a case for looking at what is happening within particular subgroups whether that's different aspects of income um, so we've done a little bit of that within words looking at, at differences whether um, the types of aspects of job quality I've talked about today are related to pay it's not clear cut um, so in some sometimes higher pay is associated with higher job quality um, Perhaps, for example, in terms of autonomy, you typically see higher paid jobs um, associated with having greater control. In other areas, it's perhaps not so straightforward. Perhaps those jobs are subject to higher work intensity. <coughs> um, so I think there is definitely a case for looking within groups. Also, um, might look, want to look at age, for example, what's happening with different age groups of workers, different regions and so on, um, and, and differences in, in inequality. Yes, I think it's very important to look at those. Okay. Thank you. Move on, then. We are very short on time. Um, John Lovett. I mean, I'm, I'm very struck that there is, you're suggesting, Mr Talbot, that there's a direct correlation between work and mortality, because that's pretty serious. And it, th therefore, it's, you know, it's not some theoretical argument of what's a good and a bad job. It is actually specifically about people's health as well as a consequence of that. Can I ask you, I mean, I, I take Patrick's point about 
you know, why would we compare with other countries just simply to make yourself feel better because we're mid-league mid rather than the bottom. But it, it is interesting to look if there are factors <clears throat> that are consistent with ones that score better. So, for example, um, I, I should know this, but I don't. Would all of the countries you've looked at, for example, have a minimum wage? Um, no. Um, they're, they're, again, they're, they're, quite, they're quite different um, across, across Europe. Some countries don't have a minimum wage, some countries do, some countries have strong levels of union, unionisation, others don't. Um, it's, there's quite a lot of variation. Um, I think that's all I can really, I can really say there, because it's not my, it's not mm -hmm. my, my, my field. It, that, it, it would be interesting to look at the impact of the establishment of a minimum wage and giving people some sense of job security at the very point when it then looks as if what was has increased job insecurity because um, of hours. I suppose the other issue, and we've not got much time to look at this, but I think it's worth exploring is the whole question of particular groups. And I'm interested, for example, um, in women who will disproportionately be in low-paid jobs in the public sector. Does that mean that that is coming out in the survey? It would matter more, or it's more likely that women are going to be carers and have external pressures. So it would matter more to them, that whole question of flexibility rather than presenteeism, which I think is a different challenge for some men and maybe in high-pressure jobs. Is there, you, you made a broad um, presentation, Lucy, but is there in your, your survey a bit of drilling down into, you know, the nature of certain sectors will mean that there's concentrations, for example, of women or people within the black minority ethnic community that we can look at further? Yeah, it's definitely possible to do that. So we cover some of we do cover some of those um, dimensions within the book. So we will look a bit, for example, at, um, at differences between between men and women, and, and as you say, quite rightly so. Um, you can then build that into the analysis. So whereas also ask employees whether they have caring responsibilities and so on, number of dependent children and, and factors. So um, it is certainly possible to look at their experiences in relation to. Um, their, their demographic characteristics and some of their circumstances at home. Yeah. And presumably whether sectors are particularly unionised or not? Yes, absolutely, definitely. Okay, thank you. Um, Joan McAlpin. Yes, Lucy, when you were talking earlier, I think in response to um, Lewis MacDonald's questions, um, you talked about higher levels of insecurity in the public sector. Um, now, your survey is GB-wide, as you've said on a number of occasions. The public sector that's under the Scottish Government's control at the moment has a no compulsory redundancies policy. Would that no compulsory redundancies policy f be reflected in your figures of the GB wide? And um, so, excuse my <laughs> ignorance, on, at what point would that have been introduced? I believe it was 2011. Okay, so it was around the, the, around the time of the field work. Um, I mean, their, their employees' perceptions of how they of how they rate their job security. So that might be that might be a result of concrete things that they observe, such as redundancy policies and so on. It may be a feeling of how they perceive things to be in the workplace. It may be something broader than just seeing a set of redundancies or policies. It might be about other, perhaps more subtle things that they pick up on generally or, or within the workplace. Um, you see, or like I could say in terms of differences, is that you do see that falling job security also if you look for Scotland alone. Um, although you're, you're right, the figures that I presented are overall for Scotland. They haven't disaggregated by private and public sector, but we could certainly look at that. Right, OK, see. thanks. And... Um, uh, just to speak quickly to, to Martin, on page four of your written evidence, uh, you have some really very interesting <laughs> figures on modelling from the Scottish Public Health Observatory over 10 years about the effect on health of different policy uh, changes. Um, for example, you see a modest 10% increase in the value of job seekers' allowance would result in 26,000 fewer years of life lost and 17,000 fewer hospitalisations. And you also talk about similar impacts in terms of raising the national minimum wage to 7.20 an hour, a 10% rise in working tax credit as well, um, which would result in 8,000 fewer years of life lost. I thought that were very, very striking figures. But the other thing that struck me was that um, these relate to changes in, uh, in things that we don't control here in Scotland. We don't control job seekers' allowance, we don't control the national minimum wage, and we don't control working tax credit. 
Would you say that was a correct observation? I'd say that's a correct observation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, check buddy. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I wonder if I may ask about the issue of control. Uh, and going back to my colleague uh, Dennis Robertson's question about collecting data, I wonder what if you've done any exercise on looking at the variations in health for those that uh, have participa full participation in the company, equity participation, participation in decision-making. And also, if you've looked at um, the third sector in social enterprises, where there is, of course, a, a almost full control. Has any work been done on that? There, there was a, a recent report um, looking at the third sector in, in Glasgow um, and some of the findings of that in terms of the experience of the em employees there in terms of their health and well-being, I, I think it was, it was actually quite a positive picture. Um, I, can, I, I think I'm probably better just finding out more, more details and, yeah, if that's okay. Uh, certainly my experience in uh, with, with companies in Europe is where you have works councils and involvement in the management process and decision making that uh, I'm not saying they're always happier than uh, uh, people here but in, th 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 there's a tendency for that. The other thing is is uh, in your paper uh, Mr Tibble you, you mentioned um, there should be work truly work off to offer for work for all and opportunities should be distributed geographically and occupationally according to need. Have you investigated, I mean, I'd love to know how you do that, but was there any discussion in terms of a mobility and how that you know, mobility, people's ability to, to move where there are jobs? You, you used the example of Aberdeenshire, for example, Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire and Glasgow. Has there been any work done on, on the mobility in desire for, of people and, and the impact that that has? Well, economists might give a slightly different answer. Um, I, think it, I think it's probably worth putting the, the case that um, if you break Scotland down into different regions, and those, for example, are the regions that are used for, for example, by Skills Development Scotland, um, that there is a, a, quite an interesting spatial pattern. And in fact, if you go back to um, uh, 2000. An eight, so this is pre-recession. Um, you do, in fact, see a, a kind of similar pattern um, in terms of uh, the west of Scotland, Dumfries and Galloway, having a relatively lower number of vacancies um, available for, for unemployed people um, against a, a more buoyant picture in the east of Scotland and um, heading, heading north. Um, into the Highlands and Islands. So um, that's not answering your question. No, it's not. No. <laughs> one, one last, very last question. There are a lot of techniques that are being applied in terms of continuous improvement process, which involves employees, and that they are effectively are involved in decision making as to how we improve the productivity of the work, workplace. Have you considered that, the implications that that's had on the well-being of employees? Um, I don't. I, I'm not aware of. I'm not aware of questions within the health service that ask those kind of questions. So I'm not. I'm not aware. If I can, but, there are. Yeah, there are. Um, I could certainly refer to. There are some papers that have looked at um, the growth of, you know, these um, methods for pre-employee involvement, or they have various terms in the literature. But there are certainly studies that have looked at. Um, the association between that and employee well-being and productivity, whether um, whether and there are sort of two main paths that can go down, whether those um, whether those practices lead to employees feeling more engaged, experiencing higher well-being, and that leading to um, greater performance for the firm, or another route where perhaps employees feel stress is more of work intensification and so on. Um, maybe the firm sees an improvement, but the employees don't. There's certainly references on that I can direct you to. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, we are out of time. Um, thank you very much to Martin Talbot, Lucy Stokes and Elaine Drennan for coming along. It's been very helpful. 
in terms of setting the scene, and we'll now have a short suspension to allow a changeover.
Right, if we can uh, reconvene, uh, I would like to welcome our second panel. We are joined by uh, Stephen Boyd, Assistant Secretary, STUC, uh, Anna Ritchie Allen, who's the Project Manager for Close the Gap, uh, Patricia Finlay, Professor of Work and Employment Relations, and Director, Scottish Centre for Employment Research, Department of Human Resource Management at University of Strathclyde, and Jamie Livingston, who's Head of Oxfam Scotland. Welcome to you all, and thank you for coming along. We've got about an hour and 10 minutes or so for this session. Can I remind members, we're not here to conduct the whole inquiry. Uh, we're just here to scene set uh, and just uh, get an understanding of the, the top line issues. Uh, also, uh, can I say to the panelists, because there are four of you, um, if you all try to answer every question, uh, it's going to take quite a long time to get through the topic. So I would ask members if they would direct their questions perhaps at one panellist initially, and then if you'd like to come in and respond to a point somebody else has, has made, just catch my eye and I will uh, bring you in as, as best I can as, as time allows. And if we can keep questions and answers fairly short, that will allow us to get through the topics um, in the time that's available uh, to us. Can I maybe just start off? Um, I think you're all here listening to the evidence we heard earlier on, uh, which is quite helpful in setting the scene. What we as a committee really are doing in, in the sessions today is trying to uh, focus down as best we can on this very broad topic of work, wages and well-being, and how we take that forward as an inquiry after the summer recess. Could I maybe just ask each of you just to say, just in a, in, a, in, a, in a few sentences, I'll maybe start with Stephen Boyd and work my way along, you know, what do you think the key issues are that we as a committee should be focusing on in this inquiry? Start with Stephen Boyd. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I think, I mean, just uh, generally speaking, I, mean, I think it's I mean, clearly the inquiry has been framed around what has happened in the labour market since 2008. I think it's quite important that we don't treat 2008 as some kind of year zero here. I think a lot of the trends in the Scottish labour market that we are concerned about at this moment in time are actually apparent before 2008. And the concern at this moment in time is the recession and the prolonged period of stagnation which followed have further embedded these trends. Nothing radically new or different has happened since 2008, but we've just seen some adverse trends become embedded. I think it's quite important to look at trends in the Scottish labour market, think through to what extent these may reverse as the recovery becomes further embedded. And there's a lot of uncertainty around that at this moment in time. But what are the implications if they carry on in the current trajectory of indeed they might intensify? So things like we have seen uh, the employment rate for women really grow very rapidly over the last uh, couple of years in Scotland. I don't think that's particularly well understood, the reasons behind that. A very important trend that we constantly draw attention to, which I think is under-discussed, is the increasing number of older people remaining in work, which again can be read in an optimistic or a pessimistic fashion, I think, and as usual, the truth is probably somewhere in between and more complex. Another real concern uh, at the moment is rising inactivity amongst young people. We've seen a big drop in youth unemployment over the last year. We've not seen a concomitant rise in employment, and therefore a lot more of young people get into inactivity. What does this mean? Are they going into full-time education and training, which would not be a bad thing, of course, or indeed, you know, are they falling out of the labour market altogether, uh, or falling out of the labour market and education altogether, which would be a real concern. So I think there's a lot of work to do to try and understand concerns a bit better. I mean, I think as the first panel demonstrated when it comes to qualitative issues round about job quality. There's a great deal of uncertainty. There's not a huge evidential base on which to draw. Uh, and I thought a couple of good points were made about the difficulty in comparing Scotland with the rest of the UK and beyond in this respect. I mean, I think in a lot of the work I've been looking at over the last few years, which have used low wages as a proxy for job, well, albeit an imperfect proxy for job quality, I think the evidential base is quite strong. I think when you try to extend that into other areas, these comparisons become somewhat more dubious. So I think the point that was Patrick, I think, made it, you know, understanding what is happening in Scotland uh, is a good thing in and of itself. Better understanding those processes, I think, is uh, a very important part of your inquiry. I think 
clearly focusing on the last point in your call for evidence about what the Scottish Government and policymakers in Scotland can do to improve job quality and indeed the number of, you know, I would argue there's been a long-standing structural deficit in decent employment in Scotland, what we can do to try to reverse that. And indeed, I'm probably come on through questions. I think there is a number of areas in which we can look at in some detail in that respect. Okay. Thank you. That was that was quite a long answer, but so I appreciate it. I did, I did spring that on you first. So. <laughs> I didn't hope to come up with something in, intelligible in the end. Thank you. Um, Anna Ritchie Allen. Um, I think um, in terms of the focus of the inquiry, that it's quite critical to understand that women and men have a very different experience of the labour market and how that impacts on local economies and on the Scottish economy as well. Um, some things to consider just very, very briefly. Um, the implications of public sector spending cuts on women's employment, um, uh, women's position within the labour market, and how both of those impact on the gender pay gap. Thinking more broadly, we need to look at welfare reform as well, because we know about the links with in-work poverty, uh, the impact on welfare reform. 85% of social security cuts have come from women's incomes. Um, that has a direct impact on women's poverty, child poverty, it impacts household budgets and it impacts on local economies as well as on the national economy as well. Um, and a couple of final points. Uh, we need to look at the underutilisation of women's skills, which uh, manifests within occupational segregation within the labour market, one of the main causes of the gender pay gap. Um, the economic arguments for addressing occupational segregation are well rehearsed. Uh, and finally, one other point we should look at is the um, equalities practice of employers in particular. There's a lot of evidence now on the public sector equality duty and how public sector employers are uh, not performing very well in that regard. We're working on that um, in a project, and I can speak later about that later on, or I'll put that in Close the Gaps response. Um, but we also need to look at the private sector as well. There's less data on that, uh, um, but we do know the instances of sex discrimination, of pregnancy and maternity discrimination, these are up, but women are unable to access justice because of tribunal fees. Okay, thank you. Uh, Patricia Finlay. Uh, can I say four? Thank you for your invitation. Can I say four things? And if I say them very quickly, I should stay within the time scale. Uh, I think the first, which falls on from this morning's session, is there is a huge issue around measures. There's no accepted one accepted measure of job quality either in this, either in this country or anywhere else. Nor indeed is there a, a map of job quality in Scotland, although there is some ongoing work that's attempting to address that. And I think there is a danger of getting drawn into what is. Um, uh, what some of the committee members drew on, which is a, a broad range of different types of survey evidence that does different things, some of which is more or less reliable than others. Um, and I think that would be a bit of a, a, bit of a diversion. Evidence is important, um, but we need to take that evidence in context. The second thing I would say is in terms of some of the findings, there's two ways to think about that in very simple terms. One is, as somebody pointed out this morning, to say on average maybe around two-thirds, if we take a rough estimate of some of the measures that were put forward this morning by NISR, two-thirds of people are quite happy quite satisfied with the kind of job quality that they have. We could look at that and we can say, fine, that's okay, let's not do anything else. Um, the key issue for me is to say what's happening with the other the other um, third or the other 40%. And that's the issue about, I suppose we can think of that in two different ways, three different ways maybe. One is to say, what are the costs that are being imposed on the people that occupy that 30 or 40%? Um, are the people in that group distinct from the people that are in the other group? So are we, do we need to understand better what the demographic map of job quality is? And I think that relates very much to what Anna's just said. Um, and what ways in which, and, and to take a less negative sense, I suppose, not just the costs imposed on individual, what's the potential for those people whose job quality is not maximised or, or not improved are we losing out on the potential of some of our populations? I think that's quite important. And I think that takes me to my third point, which is it's very important that we think about the full costs of job quality. We often think about job quality, and we talked about health outcomes this morning, in terms of the negative impacts on individuals. But in actual fact, job quality imposes a whole host of other costs. It imposes costs on the welfare system. It imposes costs on the health system. It imposes costs on the taxation system. It imposes significant 
significant opportunity costs on employers. So people who don't have decent job quality, and we know that there are some associations between uh, the level of job quality and issues of productivity and performance and innovation, that's an opportunity to cost for employers. So coming back to just finish on my last point, it seems to me that for, the, for your committee to move forward, you should try and drive that with an agenda, a problem, rather than a debate about necessarily about statistics. Thank you. Uh, fundamentally, job quality is an issue right up the income distribution, but for Oxfam, clearly the focus for us is on poverty. We're a poverty um, organisation, and, and clearly people in poverty work fairly hard for the poverty. Um, the, the impact of, 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 of poor quality jobs has an impact right across their everyday lives. They work long hours, they're on call, they work multiple jobs, still struggling though to earn enough. And in doing so, they're degrading the wider assets that they've got, um, therefore compounding um, their level of poverty. Um, so that's where we fundamentally come from in, in this discussion. Um, when it comes to definitions, there is... Um, as has just been said, no clear definition, but we need to move towards a level where we have at least some minimum benchmarks. Um, and in order to do that, we're really keen that we don't just sit around a table and just carve those up ourselves, but we actually go out and, and talk to people around them. Um, many of you will be familiar with our work around the Human Kind Index. Uh, we think a similar approach would be useful when it comes to trying to define um, job quality, and we're planning to take some research forward on that. Because fundamentally, then, we need to um, make sure that we embed how we measure success on job quality within how the Scottish Government um, um, measures its own success through um, things like the National Performance Framework, and that then informs uh, policy solutions. But, but Oxfam has also been um, focused on looking beyond government action to looking at influencing private sector in general. And we've done quite a bit of that internationally, and I can come on to, to speaking about that. And, and that international perspective, I think, is useful. Um, I think the committee um, could make gains by looking at things like the UN Framework on Business and Human Rights that starts to look at corporate responsibilities. And again, we can talk a bit more about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, that's been very helpful. I'm, well, I'm not quite sure how helpful it has been in terms of narrowing down the focus of the inquiry, but it's been helpful getting your views uh, on uh, what the priorities should be. Just before I bring others in, I just want to ask one more question um, around this idea we've, we've, we've been kicking around as a committee of, of good and bad jobs. And I suppose my question is this. Are, are, are bad jobs inevitable? in some form or another. And let me illustrate this with an example, because you know, the area I represent in, in Fife and Perthshire, agriculture and food production is a very important part of the economy. So we have very large agricultural operations employing people doing very dull, repetitive jobs in big sheds, sorting and picking vegetables, potatoes, broccoli, carrots, um, you know, working in a, a an environment where there's very little daylight, uh, in a cold environment because the temperature's kept down. You know, these are jobs that would drive me mad. I would regard that as a bad job. Um, but somebody's got to do it. So is it inevitable that, that parts of the economy will depend upon what we might call bad jobs? Is it the vector question? Um, Emily, like to pick that up? <laughs> Jimmy Livingston? I would hope not. Um, I think, I think there is uh, some structural issues with, with the economy that's worth um, talking about in terms of, you know, people talk an awful lot about how, um, for example, less developed countries have benefited from globalisation, from technology, which ha obviously has an impact in terms of um, 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 jobs for, for, for people, in terms of the impact on that, automation, etc. Uh, but it's important to, to note that this problem is, a, is an issue yes, in the UK, but also in developing countries. Where we often assume that we've exported all the bad jobs um, internationally um, and that somehow that doesn't exist here. But th that hollowing out of those middle-tier jobs has had an impact both in the UK but internationally as well. So we've actually ex created more bad jobs here, but we've exported more bad jobs internationally at the very same time. Um, in terms of whether it's inevitable, um, you can say almost anything's inevitable. We've been doing a lot of talk about inequality recently. Uh, and I'm highly encouraged by um, the number of um, eminent academics and economists coming forward and saying exactly the opposite. Inequality isn't inevitable. And I would say exactly the same in terms of job quality. There are some clear policy and measures um, that we know can have a fundamental impact on job quality. It's about the political willingness to actually 
put those into practice? I'm not sure that really answers my question, though, because my question was, you know, are these jobs, I, mean, I would regard that as a bad job, but other people might take a different view. So, and, so, and somebody's got to do that work. But may well be about job matching expectations to, mm. to, to roles as well. Patricia Finlay, yeah. I, I don't think bad jobs are inevitable, and I think I may have written a book with that very title, Are Bad Jobs Inevitable? <laughs> to, to which I hope the answer was no. Um, I think you need to be, we, we know that work is an incredible source of meaning for people. And we know that there are, and we talked about this this morning, a variety of aspects to what makes a job a good or a bad job. So there's issues of pay, there's issues about its intrinsic nature, there's issues about the relationships in which you do work, the task itself, um, issues about how much voice you have around those work. So I think it's a mistake to assume that a job that is either low skilled or routine or has some adverse physical environmental factors is necessarily a bad job. Part of what we want to do is to match uh, is to do two things. One is to align um, people's skills and talents to the opportunities that are available in the labour market. Um, and the other is to, is to try and expand those and, and expand those in ways which are meaningful for the employer and for the employee. And so the fact that a job is low skill doesn't mean that it necessarily doesn't have the other aspects that make it a good job. So it's, it's reasonably well enough paid. People are treated with respect and dignity. The danger of that argument is that we say, basically for a whole section of the economy, you can't get good job quality. Um, somebody illustrated to this asked me a question recently in a similar type of presentation where they said, you know, I, I spend my life get, trying to get people with learning disabilities into employment. For them, um, a good job is any job. And I, I very much reject the view that a good job is any job. Um, you want to have a job which reflects your skills and your capabilities, but the, the components of that, are you respected? Do you have a voice? Are you supported? Those are important parts of any job, whatever the task is. Thank you for that answer. I mean, I should say, that the workers I've met in some of the businesses I'm talking about would not regard themselves as being in bad jobs. But the perception externally might be that's a bad job. OK. Right. OK. We're going to bring some others in. Um, start with uh, Richard Lyle. Uh, you, convener. Uh, can I pose a question to Stephen Boyd? You, in your submission, uh, the STUC believes this is a crucially important inquiry. But then you go on to say the STUC has long been concerned over the range and quality of labour market statistics and the length of time it takes for these inadequate statistics to be published. And you give, um, you actually believe the Scottish Government plays a weak hand dealt by the ONS, the Office of National Statistics, very well. But these statistics compare poorly to other advanced nations. And you, the, I just love your, your last quote, which is, the sectoral employment data for Scotland is extrapolated from a UK survey and is next to useless. Can you explain that? Yeah, uh, I mean, I tried to say out quite clearly, hopefully in the paper, a range of concerns here. I'm always kind of struck by the fact that quite correctly, headline labour market statistics are the source of much uh, political argumentation in this place. I mean, that is uh, you know, entirely proper. But you look at actually the quality of the statistics that are published for Scotland on a monthly basis by ONS, they actually tell us pretty, uh, very little, I would say, about how actual real people experience the labour market in real time. And often it's uh, presented as what is happening in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK for a whole. And once you take into account uh, the margins for error in the statistics, very often we're arguing in here about very little or nothing, you know, when it comes to differences. But specifically on sectoral employment data, uh, I'm talking exclusively about the workforce jobs survey data that's published by the ONS each month which, uh, is, as I say in the paper, is extrapolated from a UK-wide survey. So it will... Uh, interview company X, which may have 10 significant workplaces in England and Wales, but none in Scotland, but it will deduce from that uh, a, a figure for Scotland. So, you know, the, the survey does not relate to the sectoral makeup of the Scottish economy. And what you've seen after the methodology was changed in 2010, I think it was, some really quite remarkable statistics. So in 2011, it was showing the highest rate of a uh, health workers ever in Scotland, you know, a, you know, a time, you know, not, sorry, uh, across the public administration services that showing the highest uh, level of workers ever in Scotland at a time we know public sector jobs were, were falling in Scotland. Now, again, it's, it's imperfect because it's not all public sector workers and that, um, 
on that actual survey. But there was a range of sectoral data coming out that just made no sense. And I know the Scottish Government have, you know, are very reticent about using these figures at this moment in time. Due to a range of problems, we essentially stop using them. The Scottish Government is able to use a number of surveys that are not published for general use to embellish these statistics and therefore come up with stats that will be more credible. But from a user's perspective like ours, then we have to be extremely cautious about how we use these. So how we, what action would you take to improve, you know, we've got so many companies employed and, and you could go out and touch anyone and they, they work for a, a statistic, you know, do statistics and there's a, the old saying, uh, dare I say it, damn lies and statistics. Uh, what would you do to improve the information that we need in order to ensure that this inquiry progresses in the right direction? Well, I mean, it's, what we're dealing with here is a problem of underinvestment. I mean, the surveys, uh, the sample size in Scotland for the Labour Force survey is too small, which is why four times a year we have to embellish it using an annual population survey, which is uh, four times the size of the Labour Force survey. So what we need are bigger and better surveys, which is going to cost someone a significant amount of money. Unfortunately, the direction of travel, ONS, as you can imagine, is precisely another direction. We were even discussing about 18 months ago the possibility of stop doing the census. And ONS seemed to be moving to a position where it was just going to be undertaking the stats required by European directives. So it was just going to be a UK version of what Eurostat produces, I think you know, we managed to, to fight that off. But from a Scottish perspective, it's very difficult to see how things are going to improve as long as we carry on in the current model, where we just kind of sometimes Scottish fi UK uh, level survey data um, without doing our own new and better surveys. But as I say, it's going to cost someone a significant amount of money to do that. Until we do that, I think we just have to be quite cautious in terms of how we treat some of the statistics that you're likely to come across in, in the inquiry. Thank you. Elizabeth Thank you very much. I'd like to come back to the, the uh, issues uh, of what makes work satisfactorily for people doing it and, and I thought one of, the, one of the strongest pieces of evidence we've seen was the workplace employment relations study and, and some of the information there. It separated out job satisfaction into pay on the one hand and everything else that the witnesses have all talked about, control, autonomy, respect uh, on the other hand. I wonder first of all uh, what the view would be of the relative importance of pay, for example, in uh, doing the kind of routine jobs that the community described, what's the relative importance of pay in the context of these other uh, aspects of job satisfaction that, 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 that you've all talked about? There's quite a lot of research which suggests that pay is not the predominant element in a uh, calculation of job quality. If you look at the European Job Quality Indicator, which is the, the most commonly used um, indicator for, for European comparison, that allocates a weighting of 20% to pay. So it suggests that other, fa other job factors are significant. I think we need to be very careful about that because um, when you ask, there's research, the research suggests that when you ask people to rank different factors of their job, pay doesn't always ar arise at the top. But we know that pay is fundamentally important to the other outcomes that people receive from jobs. So we need, I think, to be very careful about how we, we factor in some of those pay issues. Yeah. Just a bit pick up briefly on that in terms of our experience from the Human Kind Index that gave a, a nod towards elements of work. Um, of the 18 priorities identified by people in that, satisfying work to do um, came out third. Uh, secure uh, work and suitable work came out fifth, and, and all of those were above financial factors. Um, so, so I would absolutely agree that those um, non-financial factors are, are, are primary in people's minds, but there's an underpinning in terms of uh, pay levels. Could I also say one, one more thing, which is that the issues of satisfaction are very sensitive to issues of expectation. So if people expect very, very little from the type of job that they do, then their satisfaction can be quite high, despite the fact that the job is quite low quality. And we have to be very careful that that issue of expectation doesn't feed into um, a misaligned view of job quality. To take an illustration of that, for many women who downsize their careers or work in particularly flexible forms of employment during their childbearing and childrearing years, they may voice and do voice more than men higher levels of job satisfaction, but it's in a constrained context. Um, they're, they're satisfied with the job that they can get that will fit with their, with their life, but no, that's not necessarily a maximisation of their own um, potential for job quality. Okay. 
just, I, I would agree with what Patricia has said there as well, but just also add to the, um, what we know uh, from our experience of working with um, uh, on women's equality is that what matters to women as well is working somewhere that um, is inclusive of um, a workplace culture that supports gender equality and that means providing flexible working so that women can balance their caring responsibilities and other responsibilities outside of their working life. Thank you. Very quickly, uh, just add to what the others have said. I mean, I think the timing of this where survey is quite interesting. Obviously, it was in 2011. That was two years into a five-year period of falling real wages, which is entirely unprecedented in modern times. You know, you may well have started to find different results if that survey was two or three years later. I think in, in terms, again, of some of the evidence we heard in the first session, pay or income is clearly critical to inequality and, and therefore to some of the other outcomes we've talked about, although uh, the, the, the point about it being relative to other things is, is, is clearly important as well. <clears throat> One of the debates that's clearly going to happen in the next few months is over measures that have been taken, uh, for example, under the previous UK government to address relative poverty of people in work, in work poverty through tax credits and so on. And, and, and clearly that's now uh, being questioned by the current the current UK government, what, what, in, in, without, without going into the political choices between tax and, 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 and benefit, how significant are incomes, whether from Social Security or for employment, to people who are facing disadvantage in other ways uh, in, in, in the context, or in the context of, of, of work particularly? So, 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 so let, 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 let me, well, perhaps we do need to address the political question because, because it's, it's, it's going to dominate the period of our inquiry. Social Security is, has been questioned for those people in work um, with no suggestion yet, I think, from the uh, Prime Minister as to what should happen instead of Social Security support for people in work. I wonder what the panel make of that in the context of what we're examining in this inquiry. There is a particular issue in Scotland if we look at the rate of employment growth. Um, so in the submission, you'll see I've made some reference to the, the, the pay deciles in which we've seen employment growth over the, last, over the last few years, the last 10 years. And if you look in Scotland, job growth has been much um, higher in the lowest two pay deciles. So the people who are at the bottom 20% of income uh, have experienced... High, there, there are more of those jobs now, and there are more jobs in the highest three deciles. So, given that the issue of, of um, taxation and in-work benefit is likely to hit people at the lowest deciles of pay, then variation in that is likely to have quite a big, um, quite a big impact, because those are also the areas of the economy in which we've seen job growth. More and more people affected. Yeah. And, and that raises this issue of polarisation. Do we, end, do we end up with some people in the, the Scottish labour market who are doing very well? We've seen a growth. We have a very significant growth in higher level jobs, associate professional and technical jobs. Um, we've also seen a lot of growth at the bottom end. And the, the difficulty that that raises, um, for, for not just for pay, but for broader job quality issues, part of job quality is about your potential to develop your career and to maximise your own potential, means that those middle tier jobs are, are significantly lower than they, they used to be. Uh, yeah, just to add that um, it's important when having any discussion about talk about low paid workers and also um, social security cuts as well that that both of those have a gendered dimension to them. Uh, as I mentioned, 85% so far of the social spending cuts have come from women's incomes, and that is obviously the focus of an inquiry elsewhere in the Welfare Reform Committee. But looking at um, the concentration of women within low paid jobs, there will undoubtedly be a gendered impact to any. Um, increase in those? I, th I think your question raises all manner of different issues. I mean, one of the questions that has been asked in the call for evidence of what is the impact of low job quality and low pay on the economy as a whole? Well, I would argue over the last 30 years when you've seen uh, the proportion of workers' pay as a proportion of GDP fall reasonably consistently over that period. It's led to an economy that's less resilient and less stable. What you have seen is more low-wage jobs at the bottom and people having to supplement household incomes with debt. And what you've seen at the top end of the, you know, for never 
larger share going to the very top end of the distribution. You've seen it going to people with a much lower marginal propensity to consume. So it's stripping demand out of the economy and it's also enabling those people to engage in speculative investments, which have a destabilising effect as well. So I mean, I think that macroeconomic effect is very worth the committee's attention. Uh, in terms of the link with, uh, with benefits and you know, policy mechanisms that's happened over the last few years, I mean, it's, I mean, you might well want to address the political question. I mean, I, of course, will do my very best to keep politics out of it. And it's very difficult when you start getting into this kind of conversation that you, know, you immediately start getting into what government X did and what government Y did. I think it's very helpful just to look at the policy mechanisms themselves and what they have achieved. So if you look at the work that David Bell and David Iser uh, presented last week to the David Hume Institute, well, 60 slides are now up there in the David Hume Institute's website. But you can see pretty clearly from those slides the very beneficial effect that the national minimum wage and tax credits had on income distribution. Now, I would argue, I mean, that's a good thing in dampening the effect of inequality, which of course did rise less over those years in the UK than it did in other nations, but that also has a stabilising macroeconomic impact as well, which I think we have to think about. Thank you very much. Right, um, Chick Brody. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, and I'd like to thank Patricia for defining the difference between good and bad jobs in terms of perceptions versus reality. I wonder if I can ask uh, uh, Alan, a, a question. I don't think there's any one of us would demur from you know, having a focused high wage, high productivity economy, and one in which there is a quality, a quality of treatment, a quality of conditions, and where that treatment and advancement is based on merit, regardless of faith, gender, or ethnicity. We have in the economy a mini crisis in terms of a lack of engineers, and yet we can't get enough women into engineering. It's appropriate because there's a conference on that, I understand, today. You mentioned the lack of inclusion in the workplace. In that particular sector, can you <coughs> evidence the lack of inclusion and what actually happens in that, in that particular marketplace regarding women? Specifically to engineering, um, the barriers, structural barriers that women face in terms of participating and progressing within engineering roles, uh, there are some distinct to them, but there's commonalities across all of the labour market. But in male-dominated occupations and sectors, it's very similar. Um, First of all, gender stereotyping, which starts at school, means that girls are less likely to study subjects such as maths and physics, which are obviously required to go on to study engineering. Um, this also lessens again when we get to further and higher education level, because what we know about occupational segregation is that it affects um, across the whole of the skills pipeline, and girls and women detach at various points. Um, engineering firms are often in the private sector as well who are less likely to have good equalities practice but we know that when women want to take time out to have um, children that combining care with work is often quite difficult to do because there's a lack of flexible working practices. In terms of progression um, we find that there are unfair and biased recruitment practices in place, which mean that uh, progression is very often linked to what's known as the old boys network, where this is based on informal networking practices to which women don't have access or as great as access, particularly when those networking opportunities are based around stereotypical male activities, such as playing golf. Um, there also just straight out discrimination where some employers and colleagues within workplaces and broader society feel that women are just not suitable for engineering as well as the fact that engineering itself as a profession seems to have um, uh, the perception that it is something different to what it is so it's quite dirty and therefore um, I think maybe there's a, a misconception about what engineering actually is. Not to say, of course, that some girls and some women like doing things that get dirty, such as maybe working in an abattoir. So you think positive discrimination might help that? Or does it, in fact, well, in some cases, 
hinder it quite substantially. Positive discrimination is unlawful, but positive action is not. So I suppose um, some positive action measures to specifically target um, training, for example, um, pre-vocational taster sessions for girls. There's a lot of discrete project work that has been done to try and encourage girls and young women into engineering and also into other male-dominated um, sectors. And these have proven successful to an extent. But the problem with these individualised projects is that they're quite expensive and the outcomes actually only affect quite a small number of girls and women. And when the funding gets taken away from that, then the number goes back to zero. And that is why um, gender should be mainstreamed which means that every employer, um, every public sector body should be taking into account how gender equality can factor into the functioning of their organisations. Okay, thank you. One question, if I may, for Stephen Boyd. I asked the question earlier, which you probably heard, in terms of the voice uh, of the employees and, and um, how successful companies that uh, have had equity participation, management participation, uh, works Council involvement. Um, I, I wonder if you could share your views on that. I'd also like to, together with that, consider the, the growth of, substantial growth of the, of the social enterprise, voluntary sector, third sector. And what does that mean for trade unions going forward? Okay. Uh, no, I thought you made a very good point earlier on, and I think it is a major determinant factor in the quality of a job, the voice that employees have in the workplace. Uh, the McLeod Review was published six or seven years ago now that looked at uh, employee engagement across Europe and found that the UK was something of an outlier in terms of how employees had uh, voice uh, within the firms. Other countries, as you rightly identified, tend to use other mechanisms that we don't have here. So, you know, if you are in a unionised workplace and you benefit from a collective bargaining agreement in the UK, then you're probably in a better place than other workers. But, again, they don't have the kind of co-determination that is the norm in, in Germany. We've got a lower uh, level of employee-owned enterprises and some of our employee-owned enterprises are employee-owned in all but name. They don't really uh, uh, walk the walk, I have to say, in terms of you know really engaging employees in the you know, strategic thinking about the company. So, yeah, I mean, I think you know, I mean, I would put all of this under the banner of industrial democracy, frankly, and I think it is much weaker in Scotland and the UK than it is in other European countries and they benefit significantly because of that. Uh, I don't think this conversation necessarily translates very easily into a conversation about the role of the third sector in Scotland. Uh, I think some third sector organisations are unionised, tends to be the bigger ones, obviously. Uh, some third sector organisations are very well managed, uh, providing very decent quality work. Some are not. Uh, some we've seen very poor uh, quality work, actually. Uh, some industrial disputes in some of our major third sector employers over the last few years. So I think, you know, although the, you know, that sector has been playing a very positive part in discussions about how we improve the Scottish workplace, I don't think it would pay to be um, too panglossy and perhaps about the role that it has played up until now. And the impact on trade unions, the industrial democracy, more workplace safe for, for employees? Well, yeah, I mean, I think the evidence is pretty clear over, you know, in a range of places and over a long period of time that uh, unionised workplaces tend to provide better quality work. Uh, again, I don't think there's any particularly special issues there when it comes to the voluntary sector. I think it's pretty similar in terms of unionisation to the, the rest of the economy. The issues are pretty similar to all sectors of the economy. Okay, thank you. Um, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, one of the issues I was exploring with the previous panel was around how to avoid uh, being distracted by averages uh, and understanding the uh, inequalities or the granularity that, that exists underneath those figures, whether uh, inequalities of age, gender, socioeconomic background, different employment types, or, or what have you. And it relates, of course, to, to Professor Finley's early comment about, you know, if, if two-thirds of people say there's not a problem, that doesn't mean that there's not a problem. We should be looking at that, that the rest of the experience. Um, I'm, I'm aware that human beings often look for bits of information they like and they form a pattern out of it, and that's a mistake that you can often mis make. So correct me if I'm wrong, but you know we've, we've seen 
uh, some comments here in the first presentation from NHS Health Scotland uh, about the impact on mental health, not well-being in general, but mental health of income. And I don't know if you can see this or if you've had a look at it beforehand, but all of the uh, healthier ends of the score are middle all the middle incomes are, are in the healthier end of the score. All of the high incomes are spread right throughout from, from high to low in, in terms of health impact. Um, Jamie Livingston mentioned the, the uh, uh, Humankind Index uh, and some of the comments that people made about what really mattered to them was satisfying work. When they did talk about money, if I remember rightly, people talked about having enough to pay the bills or enough to live with dignity. Uh, a, a sense that enough uh, was, was a, a concept that people get. But governments, regardless of party politics, very often focus on attracting or creating high-pay uh, jobs, uh, when clearly that's not necessarily the same as, as good jobs. So I was interested that your, your discussion uh, with the University of West of Scotland, uh, one of the criteria on pay that people were talking about there was lower wage ratios between... Uh, low, middle and, and high paid uh, employees. Isn't there a strong case that creating lower wage ratios in our economy, public and private sector, would focus our minds, uh, both as employers, as employees and governments, focus our minds on what really matters in terms of job quality, which is those other factors, rather than continuing this um, slightly unhealthy delusion, in my view, that uh, high pay is, is the, the measure of what's important to attract in the economy uh, or in our own personal lives. So you're right. The Humankind Index focused on sufficiency of income. The way it was, um, the anecdote was, it, it wasn't footballers' wages that people were looking for. It was a, a, you know, an income that was sufficient to support a decent quality of, 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 of life. Um, and... But even then, those financial factors were lower than things like um, an affordable, decent and safe home, physical and mental health, etc. So that puts it in some context. I think you're right in terms of um, um, wage ratios. Um, we recently did a policy forum, um, some of the, the panel were speakers at that as well, that looked at minimum criteria. Uh, that policy forum was with the University of West of Scotland and as a somewhat of a precursor to the research that we're hoping to, to do. But reward came out quite strongly in that in terms of um, the, the gap between top and, and, and bottom. Um, uh, so, so I would agree pay, pay and wage ratios is something that, that, that would be beneficial. I also think in general, um, and speaking as somebody as a, as a former journalist, uh, journalists, politicians in, in, in general, we focus on job numbers almost exclusively. Uh, the, the job stats came out last week. Um, uh, senior figures from, from both the Scottish and UK parliaments seized on those as, 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 as um, encouraging, etc., without much reference to the quality of the jobs there. Um, so I think we've got a bit of a culture shift to do. And there is a, a degree of momentum behind this in terms of, and, and this inquiry is one part of that, there is a degree of momentum in Scotland in terms of trying to broaden the approach beyond purely numbers of of jobs to that decent quality. And in terms of those pay ratios, um, I, think, I, I think it's something that we need to do more work on. I think in previously from memory, we've talked about a sort of one to 20 um, ratio. That's completely non-reflective of, of current pay ratios, particularly in terms of um, large FTSE 100 companies, for example. Anybody else, and, and in particular in terms of what government economic policy or enterprise agencies' uh, practices and so on can do to help shift the focus away from fetishising high-paid jobs and into the, the things which, which matter more in terms of quality and, and the equality uh, of people's experience of that? Can, can I say that we do know from, from a whole stream of research over a very long time the, how, how important equity is to how people perceive fair or unfair pay. So equitable comparisons with people who work in the same organisation as you or who do the same job as you in another place. So equity is a really fundamental part about how people perceive issues of fairness. The, it's, it's challenging in terms of ratios to work out where the ratio would apply. So that comparison is not always an internal one in one organisation. Um, it's not just what happens in your workplace irrespective of what happens in other workplaces. There is a related debate around how we've seen uh, the mechanisms through which we've seen 
inequality rise in some organisations, and inequality has risen in part, not in full, but in part related to issues of individual payment for performance. And that takes us into another area of, of concern around job quality, which is around the issue of performance management targets, which I think sits very nicely with some of the WARES data on intensification. So, so the, the, that issue of equity is very important, but there's not an awful lot of levers which, um, particularly in private organisations, government can use at any level to try and deal with issues of, of, of ratios and equity. Uh, a couple of points. I mean, I think a more compressed wage distribution is very desirable for the reasons outlined earlier in the discussion round about inequality. It's how best to achieve that. I, mean, I would argue those nations that have a much more compressed distribution also don't have a national minimum wage do benefit from very high levels of collective bargaining coverage, I mean, Nordic nations in particular. And I would argue collective bargaining is a much more efficient way of managing that more compressed wage distribution, uh, as well, you know, particularly when there are strong social partner organisations there to engage at a national, national level collective bargain. Much more effective way of doing that than by applying uh, wage ratios. And Trisha has already alluded to some of the difficulties uh, around about that. Very quickly, I want to come back to the point you made about mental health, because I think this is a huge issue, and this also relates again to the point about performance management that Trish has uh, just raised. I, mean, I make mention in a written submission to the research and performance management we published a couple of years ago, uh, with specific reference to the retail banking and communication sectors, which shows you know, the new forms of performance management, which again seem to have become more embedded post the recession, are having a real and very detrimental impact on people's mental health because they're seen as arbitrary, they're seen as intensifying work. You know, uh, and I think this is kind of borne out in the statistics. I mean, what we have seen over the last few years, despite all the efforts, is you know, the number of people in disability benefits started to fall kind of post-recession, you know, continued you know, very, very weak um, falls, have recently started to tick back up again. But what we've seen is the composition of people who are claiming uh, benefits has changed quite radically, from people with musculoskeletal disorders who used to work in heavy industry, etc., to people who are now, it's overwhelmingly dominated now, people with mental health problems, particularly stress and depression. You know, so I mean, there must be some link I think there are changes in the modern workplace, although I'm not aware of any you know, empirical research that bears that out particularly strongly. I forgot, I'll come back to your last question if you want about what, what government might do. I mean, I think it's quite difficult in the Scottish context. I think much of what government should be doing, it's already doing through things like the Fair Work Convention, which is in its uh, very early stages. I think, you know, because I mean, I think the research shows, particularly around about low wage work, that the quality of labour market institutions is absolutely pivotal here. And the most important labour market institution, again, is collective bargaining. So anything that can be done through the Fair Work Convention to make the case for wider collective bargaining coverage and to help make that happen, I think, will be particularly important. There's a whole range of moral suasion kind of techniques they can use, and I guess the business pledge is the latest one, although we have some concerns about how that's planned out. Clearly, economic development policy and what sectors you choose to invest in is going to have a long-term impact in that as well. Any of these issues, uh, criteria for applying for uh, corporate welfare systems like the Regional Selective Assistance Grant? Well, it was interesting, wasn't it, that when the programme for government was announced, or the business pledge was first mentioned in the programme for government, it seemed to have an element of conditionality to it, eh, that your support from Scottish Enterprise, Skills Development, Scotland, etc., would be conditional on you signing up to this pledge. That conditionality element has now been completely lost. It's a volunteeristic tool. Now, you could make the case it's, it's all progress, you know, so I wouldn't want to be too critical of it. Some concerns there about how it might cut across some of the work already taking place at the living wage, which is more of a concern. I think if companies, by signing up to the business pledge, self-certify self as living wage employers rather than through the Scottish Government-funded accreditation process, then there might be something of a problem emerging there. And the last two things we quickly mention is clearly public procurement. And you know, there's been much discussion again about uh, new indicators of employment, and I think that discussion is already happening through the Scotland Performance Roundtable. We seem to be making some progress in the early part of last year. I'm not entirely sure where that work has reached at this point, but any new indicators that we can develop to again better reflect how the labour market is affecting people in, in real times, all to the good. Yeah, just a couple of points. Sorry. 
Um, one which was linked to um, what you mentioned um, in relation to um, a focus on high growth businesses and in particular the model that's used by the economic development ages is in terms of providing business support to self-employed people. Um, the experience of um, women who own businesses, and this is uh, well evidenced and um, promoted by Women's Enterprise Scotland, is that um, women-owned businesses um, find it more difficult to access business support that is specific to their needs, more difficult to access financial support, and because the economic development agencies um, focus on um, high growth businesses, then they're excluded. So in some ways they can get start-up um, support from Business Gateway and whatnot, but that in itself is not necessarily what they need when they've reached a certain level. So there's a glass ceiling there for um, women-owned businesses because of the focus that's on high-growth companies. Um, and one other very quick point, which I know you didn't ask about this, but it's related to performance-related pay, is that there's a gendered aspect to that as well, particularly um, oh, well, when it is related to pay, because we know that when um, individuals um, are able to negotiate their own pay, the potential for pay discrimination um, increases massively. Thank you. Just a quick point. I would endorse lots of what Stephen said. Uh, in terms of the, the, the round table and national performance framework, we have been involved in that. Uh, we've been pushing for um, a, a broadening of that review to take into account, for example, the Scottish Government's current economic purpose, which has economic growth at its core, um, despite what we know in terms of uh, that being disproportionately captured by, by the wealthiest. Uh, but currently the purpose and the national outcomes weren't up for review. It was the indicators. In terms of relevant indicators for decent work as well, I think we could um, serve with having a, another look at those. There are, for example, an indicator around improved economic participation, but that doesn't account for uh, the quality of that economic participation. So we need to establish what matters to the people of Scotland and embed it within how we measure success, because all too often that then skews the policy focus. Right, I'll bring in Dennis Robertson. Um, I think we'll probably all agree that we've got a fairly wide-ranging uh, inquiry here and to some extent I think fairly complex um, and I'm just wondering you know because one of the aspects of the inquiry is the well-being because uh, we're looking at sort of impacts uh, I think and, and I'm interested obviously that the, the work of the Fair Work Convention w w hopefully will will look at uh, I think some of the um, impacts and hopefully uh, positive outcomes um, with in danger of even broadening the inquiry even further, um, a, are we doing enough in terms of at the education level prior to work to try and uh, align people's expectations, uh, um, skills, ability to get into the right kind of job, the job that is a uh, um, going to match their expectation, ability, skill, uh, and obviously, you know, that in includes uh, all sectors of the population, including um, women, people with disabilities. Um, and I'm just wondering, are we doing enough at that sort of careers end and advice end, or is the culture still the barrier uh, in, in taking that forward? Maybe Patricia first, if. I think there's a huge amount of very positive work going on around, the, obviously primarily engaging Skills Development Scotland, but other agencies um, and the education system itself in trying to make sure that there is a much better matching of um, what people leave school with and the destinations in which they, they may end up. There is, a, there is a slight problem with that, I suppose, which is if you have concerns that we have pockets of very poor quality work, then... Um, one of the arguments about aligning very closely to what employers currently need is that we might recreate the same pattern. So we may reproduce poor quality work rather than encouraging um, through skills acquisition and skills utilisation, which is very important, people to undertake higher value work and higher quality work. So the policy push over the last couple of decades in Scotland and in the rest of the UK has been acquisitions of, acquisition of relevant qualifications. It's been about supply push. If we push enough skills and qualifications, accredited qualifications into the economy, then it'll have an impact. And the reality is it hasn't had a great deal of impact at all. And the barrier there is not that the education system doesn't recognise what the world of work needs, which I think it recognises quite well. It's that those skills and talents are not properly deployed in the workplace. And that comes back to issues around 
around the design of jobs, how, jo how broad those jobs are, whether or not they're inviting and welcoming to different demographics within the population. If I can just use one, um, one illustration of that that's in, the sub in my submission, uh, we have the lowest proportion of, uh, of all across the EU countries that participate in the JQI, JQI, the lowest proportion of workplaces in which people can engage in discretionary problem-solving activity. Um, now, that's that may or may not, you know, we, we may think that that's not an issue, but we also have um, the lowest G7 productivity, and those things might be connected. It's difficult to establish a statistical connection, but they might be connected. So and it's not, I think, an issue just about trying to define what people do when they come out of school, but it's also about opening up the world of work to be inviting to an increasingly well-educated and well-qualified school-leaving population. Positive destination, which sounds great. You know, because it's, it's, it's very positive. Um, it doesn't have any negative connotation at all. But depending on the type of work that a person's going into, you know, are they getting any real satisfaction? Is it impacting on their health at an early stage? And a, have we taken into account the shift in uh, the, 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 the type of work? Because we're no longer a, a, a heavily sort of industrial a nation, which we're probably still... Uh, I would think still uh, the impact of the health on the nation is still there from a, a lot of that previous work. Um, so I'm just really trying to get, you know, is are we doing enough um, or what can be done in terms of the sort of positive destination for young people going into employment that, that's not going to impact negatively on their health? Stephen, maybe? I don't know. Just, um... Yeah, I mean, the school end of things is not, I'm not tremendously well informed about that. I mean, I think it is important to emphasise that we do know through recent research that prolonged periods spent in low quality, low wage work or cycling between low quality, low wage work and periods of unemployment have very similar effects on young people and indeed older people that prolonged periods of under, uh, unemployment do. So, I mean, there is, I mean, we know in Scotland we're still living with the consequences of those long term effects of prolonged periods of un, uh, unemployment. So it's important to uh, understand the extent of the potential problem here. I think there's also a general point to be made about the kind of uh, the labour market system is managed by government we have in the UK, which is very much a work-first uh, approach and prioritises getting people into any kind of work as quickly as possible. If you were to compare that to the Danish model, for instance, which is generally regarded as the most uh, efficiently functioning labour market in the world, that places a lot more emphasis in matching people correctly with work, you know, so uh, if someone loses their job, they have much higher benefits, which allows them to take a bit more time to make sure they get the right job rather than just any job. Uh, I don't think we change from our system to the Danish system tomorrow. I don't think it's probably even uh, particularly wise to try and do that too quickly, but I think we have to start thinking through the consequences of that work first model and what that means in the longer term. Uh, I'm also forever emphasising to people just how little money we spend in active labour market policy in Scotland and the UK compared to other European nations. I mean, Denmark, again, not only do we spend significantly less as a proportion of GDP, we come very close to spending actually less than they do in nominal terms, you know, in its economy at 12th our size. So if we want our active labour market system to function and function well, then it has to be much better funded and funded much more consistently and less cyclically than the UK system has been. Fair Work Convention sufficient enough to take us down that sort of transitional pathway um, for this matching the skills to which will hopefully equate to better health for the nation. Um. Trish is probably in a better place yeah. to answer that. Myself. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm very mindful that I'm um, here in a professional capacity and not representing the Fair Work Convention, yeah. to which I am the academic advisor. Um, the, the remit of the Convention, as you'll have seen from any of the published documents, is actually very broad. Um, it's to provide, a to provide a framework in the first year of its operations, to provide a framework for fair work in, in Scotland. Um, and the, commission's at, the Convention's at the very early stages of its deliberation. But it's dealing with um, an awful lot of issues that are very similar to what have been, dis to what have been discussed here this morning. So, in its, and, and this, is a, this is a kind of working definition, but the Convention's very interested in looking at work that provides opportunity, fulfilment, security, dignity and effective voice. And some of that, particularly in terms of opportunity, will look at um, 
issues of transition into the labour market um, and how people move in and out of the labour market. So the I suppose, uh, like yourselves, the Convention has a very big job to do over, um, certainly in its first, on its first target, quite a short period of time, but part of that is within the remit, and it is taking evidence from all of the public agencies as well as a broader range of stakeholders to try and um, inform its work in that area. Okay, and I, I was keen to come in. Yeah. Um, just to go back to your original question about schools uh, and uh, how schools are preparing young people for entering the labour market, we're involved in a bit of work just now which is looking at occupational segregation and modern apprenticeships in the West Lothian local authority area. We've been working with colleges and schools and the education authority to identify where along the pipeline there can be positive points of intervention to address this. And one message that is coming back quite clearly from a number of different stakeholders is that young people who do not go on to university but maybe go to college or go straight into the labour market, the message coming back from employers is that the young people are lacking very basic skills that could be classed under employability, like how to, how to be interviewed, how to fill out an application form, um, how to behave in a formal setting like that. So um, that has come back for a number of different stakeholders, seems to be quite common. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, John Lamont. Thanks very much. Um, I suppose the focus, I think, for the inquiry yeah, it is about the individual, and it's not good if you're ill because of the job you're in and your life expense on, but it's also about why that's bad for the economy. And I think, um, Stephen, you, you reflected that. So I'm interested how we get a proper sense of actually what's happening. I, I would probably think it's a distinction between a hard job and a bad job. I mean, I was talking to a care assistant in a nursing home last week who said she loved her job. You couldn't possibly expect to make a lot of money out of it, but she was content in her work. Whereas, you know, I know someone who works in the care sector, which involves not getting paid till you get to the place and under phenomenal pressures. And I wonder what we can, um, <coughs> how we get a proper understanding of um, actually what's happening. Another example of somebody working in, in the hotel sector thinking she'd get a certain number of hours and was told that she would get paid per room that she cleaned. So it would be useful to get your ideas about how we get that evidence to properly understand um, what I think is a casualisation of, of too many workforces. So maybe ask Stephen directly, first of all, on this question of zero-hours contracts. You say that there's a longer-term trend that we should be aware of rather than just explaining it all by the recession. Perhaps the re recession has become a justification for some of these things. And you also said that the zero-hours contract issue is largely because people now understand it and they had no expectation of anything different. To what extent do you think business now actively use, sees a, some business see that actively use zero hours contracts or casualisation as part of their business model? And what can we do about that? Uh, okay, can I say first? I mean, I think it's probably quite important that the committee is realistic about what is likely to be achieved in quantifying this problem. I think for the range of reasons we've already heard this morning. I mean, I think the zero hours contract uh, issue is illustrative of the wider problems. Now, it's not something that ONS has published on over a prolonged period of time, but since it's become a political issue, they have done their best to try and go back and redesign the Labour Force survey and some of the employer surveys to get a better handle on what has happened. So, I mean, the graph I think I've got in my evidence seems to show a huge jump in 2012. Now, we would attribute that to a better understanding of people, well, people understanding that they're on zero hours contracts. So, when they're then asked the question by the uh, uh, the survey of they're able to answer accurately, but as before, if they were asked, are you on a zero-hours contract, it wouldn't have been put in precisely that way, but, you know, does your contract guarantee you a certain number of hours? They'll probably answer them inaccurately. So that big jump in 2012 probably reflects more accurate responses. ONS have also done a lot of work with employers, which suggests the figure is uh, significantly higher, uh, because clearly employers uh, answer the survey more accurately. But for a range of technical reasons, ONS seem to think that that probably overestimates the number of zero, zero hours contracts. So, I mean, I think to be fair, them, over the last couple of years, they've done a lot of work in this, and they're working towards a point where we're going to get a much more accurate measure of the number of zero hours contracts in the economy. Hopefully, that will be disaggregated in a national and regional basis by ONS as well. We've tried to do our best to extrapolate from the UK figures and understanding that the trends are slightly different, particularly in the health service, which might have Scotland slightly below the UK average in this, and we've come up with an estimate for zero hours contracts. But we're unable to... I mean, the question that you concluded with there, I mean, do you think 
employers are increasingly taking advantage of labour market conditions to um, uh, to offer work which is less secure than in the past. I mean, I think that anecdotally I can say that is true. And it's not, of course, just serious contracts. There's also things like pay between assignment contracts. There's self-employment, which I mean, we know in the construction sector, for instance, bogus self-employment has been a very long-standing issue. But we now see things like call centres offering people work, which is in, you know, on self-employed contracts. And people quite do often don't understand that until they're you know, on the point of starting the job. Uh, so I think anecdotally we can say it's happening, but I mean it would be irresponsible to try and quantify that to any extent. I mean, we just don't have the information that would allow us to try and begin to put numbers at a Scottish level on, you know, the, the proportion of work that is becoming more insecure and the proportion of work that's become more insecure since 2008. I just don't think we can do it. But if we if we accept that <clears throat> insecurity in work is bad for the individual and bad for the economy, what are the things that we can do to encourage people? to move away from that kind of model? Well, again, I mean, I would start with the pessimistic point that I think, you know, a number of, you know, in the UK, we've got a highly deregulated labour market and an even more deregulated product market, which has practically forced a lot of firms down what we would describe as low-road approaches to competitiveness. And I think many companies' business models are built on insecure, low-wage work. And I think for these kind of employers, it's going to be very difficult, frankly, to set them down another direction. And you can present all manner of case studies, uh, companies that do this things, these things well. They're unlikely to resonate with that kind of company that's doing fine, frankly, by running these uh, kind of business models. I think, you know, I would go back to what we can do in Scotland to try and change behaviours in this respect. I could really do no more than list that uh, range of activities uh, I gave in uh, reply to, to Patrick's question. But again, some of these are pretty long term and pretty difficult. You know, in terms of economic development policy, I mean, moving beyond the key sector led approach to economic development, I think that's really important. We're engaged in our project with the Scottish Government at the moment. Look to do just that, but I mean, the outcomes are frankly long term and highly uncertain, and it would be again irresponsible to over promise in terms of what that's likely to deliver. Mm -hmm. Can I ask me just finally on the question of unionisation? I think it's interesting that the minimum wage policy developed out of particularly women trade unionists feeling that collective bargaining in itself wasn't going to address job segregation and so on. But if it's the case that unionisation then reflects less job insecurity, what in policy terms could be done to support that? Or is it the business of, of the government at any level to be involved in that? Um, I mean, I th again, I would emphasise, although clearly higher rates of unionisation are a good thing from the SDUC's perspective, in terms of the literature, of what is really important is collective bargaining coverage. And there's a subtle but very important distinction between the two. And you have, for instance, I mean, France would be the outlier in this respect. It's got 8% union density, but it's got, you know, 85, 90% collective bargaining coverage, you know, for historical and cultural reasons. So what can the government do to encourage and support collective bargaining at Scottish level? I mean, you know, uh, I guess the easy answer to that is the Fair Work Convention. We'll be looking at this very issue over the coming years. I mean, to try and give you a slightly more useful answer to that. I mean, it can look at sectors which currently, well, you, know, you could start with the key sectors where currently the Scottish Government provides a significant amount of support, you know, and you can look at some of the major employers in those sectors which are unionised, have managed to change workplace organisation, job design through engagement with the union. You can sell the story through very effective case studies, and we've done that ourselves through what's happened at, for instance, Rolls-Royce and East Kilbride, uh, what happened at Diageo up in Methyl. There are very good case studies uh, in that respect. You could be slightly more ambitious and look at some sectors that we know are, uh, you know, suffer from significant a very high proportion of low wage low quality work social care would be uh, probably the most obvious sector and again government procurement plays a major role in there so how could you start thinking through the various levers that government has with these sectors how we could use it to encourage, even in the first instance to encourage a more uh, social european social partnership type approach between employers and unions in these sectors to try and determine things round about pay and job quality, etc., moving towards perhaps a more prescriptive collective bargaining arrangement. I think there's quite a lot can be there, but there's no as I probably just demonstrated, there's no quick snappy answer to that. I mean this is complex long term stuff, unfortunately. Okay.
Could I maybe tie up just two parts of your question there? And I think in relation to both Syria and anti issues of unionisation, I mean, we know that um, we know we know the impact of collective bargaining coverage. Um, Comparatively, so if you look at the Joseph Rounty's work from, from a few years ago, collective bargaining coverage is the single factor that, in, that is related to whether or not there are high proportions of low-paid jobs in an economy. So we know that it's very significant. Um, in, from the point of view of, of Scotland and the UK, I, I would invite you to consider um, the fact that there are there's no evidence of any other alternative systematic forms of voice in UK organisations. Um, we have, you know, had. T times over the last couple of decades where we've talked about non-union channels of collective and individual voice. But the reality is, if you look at the Workplace Employment Relations Survey, um, only 7% of UK workplaces have standalone non-union forms of representation. So we know that collective bargaining produces good outcomes. We know that in the absence of collective bargaining, actually there's not, there's not much evidence of any other channel at all other than one-to-one -one communication between employees and managers. I take that back to your issue of, of zero-hours contracts. A knee-jerk issue around zero-hours contracts is, is from, my, from my point of view, problematic in the sense that there will be circumstances where individuals and employers will be able to align around that. Um, perhaps no, a very small proportion of zero-hours contracts will take that form. But how you resolve that issue is by having a mechanism of dialogue and voice. Um, and so the two things actually are quite well aligned. Jim. I think what we've talked about here is that the Scottish Government's focus right now has been on movement building. It's been about cajoling um, I, rather than in, in some ways forcing or, or really incentivising through things like the business pledge. Uh, there's no doubt there's a, there's a business case, economic case to be won with employers on it. And all the evidence points that there's no trade-off between job quantity and job quality. And indeed for businesses um, who provide decent work, they report lower staff turnover, higher levels of loyalty, better employee morale, lower costs in terms of sick pay and higher productivity. Um, and I just wanted to flag a, up a couple of areas where we have seen progress, or certainly through our international work, which has much more been about supply chains, um, trying to find common cause with consumers and buyers um, has, has worked effectively through, through the Behind the Brands scheme, which really tries to have um, corporate brands competing against each other for improved practice. Now, we, we did some work with the 10 uh, biggest global food and drinks companies, um, and that led to the likes of Coke and Pepsi competing with each other publicly um, on things like land grabs and land rights within their supply chains. And equally, it's not just about um, being critical from the outside. It's about supporting businesses towards better practice. So we've done some work with Unilever, for example, in 2013. They allowed us to examine their supply chains in, in Vietnam. That looked at things like collective bargaining, living wages, working hours, contract labour. And that led to a, a joint report and positive action from Unilever. Now, I'm sure we would have wanted them to go further, but that's, a, that's a, a, an opportunity for where that moral suasion comes into, comes into its own. Okay, thank you. Um, follow up from Chief Rodinger. Just following the, the, uh, the comment that was made about contracts, uh, just having completed, but not completed, it's still ongoing, uh, a project regarding youth football. One of the things that surprised me in contact with HMRC and also BIS was that uh, any contract that pays less than the minimum wage isn't a contract. It's not worth the paper it's written on. Have you come across that? No. Just a point. Just maybe worth. Okay, can I just ask one, one question just to, just to finish off? Um, one of the things we've been looking at as a committee is whether there are particular sectors of the economy we should concentrate on. Uh, we've talked about the care sector, we've talked about hospitality, for example. Do anybody have a view? I mean, are these, would these be good, good examples, or are there, are there other sectors you think we should focus on? Anyone? Food and drink are, are very important sectors. Food and drink is very interesting because it has a very high proportion of high quality work as well. It has high quality work as well as low quality work, so it's quite a polarised sector. Um, hospitality, I think, is interesting um, for a variety of different reasons. There's no, necessarily, no necessary link between um, the level of value production in hospitality and the quality of jobs, so you don't necessarily have a much better job if you work in a five-star hotel than if you work in a no star B and B, um, so it's an in, both of those are, are, are interesting areas. There are also areas where, clearly, in terms of the proportion of women workers, there are, there are huge gender issues. Yeah. Sure. 
I think from our point of view as well, that one of the things that hasn't been mentioned yet but uh, is the concept of value and how we value types of work and who's doing that particular type of work. Um, and Joanne alluded to it there, talking about female-dominated um, workplaces in the care sector. So if you are going to look at the care sector, then obviously it's women that are concentrated within that sector. It's low paid, and it's low paid because it is women that are doing it. So what we know about undervaluing is it comes, there's two aspects to it. It is um, the type of work that women tend to do because it's traditional done in the home, such as caring, is low paid because women do it and because the skills are not seen, um, um, they're not valued very much. And then there's the other type of undervaluing where women are paid less for doing the same work as men. So I think that any particular sector focus needs to take, uh, the whole inquiry needs to take a focus actually on value and how that contributes towards job quality. I think that's, that, that's really important in terms of how you define work and, and whether this inquiry looks at unpaid work, um, for example, within its, its remit as well. And just broadening beyond the sectoral focus, I guess, um, as well as women, ethnic minorities, migrant workers, more likely to, to work in the types of jobs where, where job quality is an issue. So perhaps worth taking that into account. Okay, great. Stephen. Financial services, I think, is particularly interesting. I think for a number of reasons, and clearly hitherto it has provided pretty decent employment, uh, particularly in retail banking. It's obviously been through massive change over the last few years, and certainly our quite strong anecdotal evidence suggests that the quality of work has deteriorated very significantly. But I think probably most importantly, looking to the future, it's uh, a sector that's really going to be the... the We'll stand four square to the world, and I guess, in terms of technological change and what that might mean for job quantity and quality. So I think that's perhaps worth looking at. Okay. All right, thank you. That's been helpful. And I think we're at the end of our time. So can I, on behalf of the committee, say thank you to all of you for coming along. It's been very useful just to help set the scene. And no, and no doubt we will come back to you as the inquiry continues. Uh, and at that, we will suspend and go into private session. <laughs>